making the tragically hip look tragically lame. That's the Crash Jones Band with our theme song, Diamonds Ain't Forever. Welcome to Up and In, the Dynasty podcast, episode three. My name is Scott Sloniker. Yes, we are still doing this. Uh, yes, I am out of ideas after we go to, through everybody in the league, but we still have a bunch more people to go. And in this episode, we're talking with John Gaminski, another one of the original eight. I think we figured out in the past um, eight people who have been with the league since its inception in 2013. And now we are in our ninth season and we all care. And if you're watching this and you're not in the league, you may not care, but that's okay. We're, I'm, I'm comfortable with that. I mean, I want everybody to know. Anyway, John, how you doing? I'm doing well. The original eight makes it sound like I'm part of like a, a like a elite class, like the Yankees or something. Right. But really, if they put together everyone's career records, I don't think that uh, I would be anywhere near uh, some sort of founding member status. But, you know, we're, we're pushing along. We're doing our thing out here. So. Yeah, the um, it always makes me think of uh, the, kind of the sub nickname for the lineup of the of the famous Cincinnati Reds big red machine teams in the 70s. Uh, they would call the the position players the great eight. And uh, <laughs> that's, you know, I that that was always and they'd always talk about, you know, they're so great. They don't even all have to be in the lineup together. And in 1975, <laughs> when the team won 108 games, those eight players who, um, you know, the, the uh, you know, Rose, Bench, Morgan, those, those guys, the, the World Series lineup only played together like 20 games out of the season. They were so good. They didn't even need to be there all the time. I know. Anyway, I don't know if that's us, but uh, yeah, I'm batting eighth in that lineup. I'm like the sub guy. I'm like, the, I don't even know who I would say like Jason Castro, maybe just someone really <laughs> just, just you're, you're I, batting 209 with a lot of strikeouts, but you occasionally he, run into one, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah. You know, it's the, good defense though. Good defense, but it's true. Nothing well, respected, about. solid yes. ball player. I hope. Um, <laughs> Because I, I asked you, I asked you earlier, you know, um, had you, I couldn't remember if you had won any of the seasons of the league with your team, the, the St. Lunatics, uh, but you. I, Did you look it up? Please don't tell me you looked it no, up. No, actually I didn't because I figured this was your chance to um, tell a little white lie if you wanted to. No, well, my, my claim to fame, and this is the only reason I remember this, but the last season I competed, well, I made the playoffs. I've tried to compete every year. You know, it's a good chance. Okay. No, that's right great. There. But, uh, but the last season I was in the playoffs, I traded for Mariano Rivera at the deadline. So okay. I, it feels like it's been uh, like 15 years since he pitched in the major leagues, even though it hasn't, but it's been a while. He's in the hall of fame. He's been retired for at least five years. <laughs> Stop. All right. Take it easy on me. But uh no, I, you know, when we started this, I had never played in a dynasty league before. Yeah, and, me neither. And I had ideas about what to do, you know, and like, yeah. you, you play, you know, you play a single season or whatever, you know how to handle it. But once I kind of like my team was kind of really built for a couple, a couple of years, it wasn't really a long term planning thing. And then since that's happened, I found it really hard to get out kind of like, I'm sure how a lot of major league baseball teams feel like, yeah. you know, the Pittsburgh pirates. Let's, let's talk to them since we're in the NL central. But, you uh, know, yeah. Right. It feels you like, are just for completeness of facts. Uh, you are a huge Chicago Cubs fan. Life yes. Life. Okay. Yes. All right. Life now life pirates, life. they suck. Go for it. Yes. Let's, let's bash on the pirates because it's been uh, 10 years since the Cubs are really bad. So, yeah. but it, I, you know, I watch them all the time and I, get the same feeling about my, about my dynasty team, because I just, I have a couple players every year that I'm excited for that. I hope they'll turn the page or, you know, blossom or, you know, whatever the situation is. Mm -hmm. And it just doesn't work out where like a, three guys have a really good year, but then three guys the last year who were starting to build up fell off and, you know, jumped into a crater. So it's like, yeah, I just feel like I'm always treading water and just, you know, some trades haven't been great or whatever, but I don't feel like I've done a bad job. It's just, it feels like other people, like, you know, if you watched whatever team, if like the Dodgers in real life, you just feel like other teams are like cheating. Because it's yeah. Like, hey, I, I definitely feel like the Dodgers guy. cheat when I look at their record. Yeah. Yes. Well, um, not this year so far, but you no. know, exactly my point is that it yeah. feels like every other team has six guys do well that, you know, they were kind of hoping or whatever. And then you're like, Oh, how did this guy get X and X player? Who's 23 with a 
two ERA, you know, in the fifth round of our draft or something. Right. I'm like, golly, no, I have taken chances. I think my biggest problem as a GM has been always gravitating towards picking arms and pitchers mm -hmm. who are, you know, high draft slots, whatever. And I knew the risk going into all these picks, but I mm -hmm. I'll just, you know, I think it just matters so much. Like the one guy I have hit on really is Walker Bueller. Mm -hmm. It was, you know, but every year I take a few of these guys and it's like one or two or three of them just don't even make it to triple A or double A or something. You know, I took, who was the kid from Miami? Got first overall pick, uh, Tyler Kolek, Tyler Kolek. Oh yeah. Kolek, right. Through a hundred. Yeah. And it's just yeah. like, geez, he's out of, I think he's out of baseball now. And he might be. Yeah. It's just, uh, it's yeah. been tough, but you know, I really enjoy it. Even you know, even if I don't, I'm not in there every day, you know, mm -hmm. setting lineups based on their, you know, their current 10 day streaks and whatever. It's, it's fun just to keep an eye on these 20 players or so that I've been like Brian. I was just watching Brian Anderson, yeah. play. I've had that guy since, you mm -hmm. know, the draft and it's cool to see him, you know, do really well. Uh, I mean, just think a couple of years ago, he was like the best position player on the Marlins. And now yeah. like they've kind of stealthily gotten better. Yeah. And now Anderson, he's kind of a role player. He's kind of an afterthought. And Exactly. I thought Brian Anderson was going to be a key for 10 years, you know, and yeah. you're like all oh, the Marlins aren't going to play anyone. And no. yeah, here they are just kind of, he's kind of just doing mediocre things and he's a good uh, microcosm of my whole dynasty <laughs> reign so far. Oh, geez. Yeah. Well, listen, it's, um, one thing there's a couple things I've learned about about this league that um you know one is that if you just kind of if you just do the sandlot thing and show up every day and and pay attention and, and set your lineup and if a guy's injured put him on the IL and if a guy you know who's not on your roster comes up to the big leagues you put him you know you bring him up unless he's going to sit on the bench or something or he's you know I mean there might be some reason not to um you just and you just do that you 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 at least achieve a mediocrity like even if a lot yeah. of your players don't work out you you know it's the it's the people who kind of don't do that who end up in last place yeah and it, like i won I, i'm uh i won i believe i'm one and one right now and to win that one week felt like winning a postseason series You're two like and I two aren't like, you Let's go. see that's Maybe what two. i didn't know for sure about the rec yeah i've won okay. twice well, it's the same percentage now. you also are winning you're beating me this week so um we'll, we'll see if that happens. I don't know. that one so that's what i'm saying is that this year like i'm like okay like i like this you know we're doing all right but yeah you know we're a couple more injuries away from the pitching staff that it's not going to be uh yeah. you know that's how it always is and my you know compared to some of the guys in our league who are just absolutely fantastic at roster building and my team is not deep enough right now because i don't mm -hmm. partially because i don't really want to commit salary going forward to guys who, you know, a Brian Anderson, for example, you know, he's done well, but guys who could help me out today who might cost me, you know, two years from now or whatever like that. I'm right. kind of just free agents, free agents to sign them off this quote unquote, the street. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny. Yeah. Um, signing them off the street. I mean, that's in our league, it's proportionally much more expensive than it is to develop again, using the quotes. Um, yeah develop a, a young player you know by develop we mean you know draft him in our in our fake bet fantasy and, baseball so, and, and just stare <laughs> him in an excel sheet and, just, and put him in an excel oh, sheet dude, and link his coming. base link his baseball reference page uh, or his <laughs> mlb.com page um in our in our weird google drive spreadsheet <laughs> i i i think out of my top 20 websites visited of all time that excel spreadsheet gets so much attention for like two months. I'm staring at that thing yeah. like, okay. And I have such a hard time cutting players. This is a whole nother issue too. I know, is, I know. Is that I'm a, like, I'm, I'm a player's GM. If I were to, you know, I'm not like a, a cold. Oh, cross Crash would love to hear that. He wants the players to start an imaginary union. And I said, no <laughs> LARPing. So, you know, go ahead. Yes. And it's just like, uh, Lewis Brinson, another Miami Marlin was the biggest example of this. I, believed in Lewis Brinson. I wanted Lewis Brinson to succeed more than maybe. Had all Lewis the tools Brinson. except hitting the ball. Yeah. And he just, uh, one year after another, 177, 208. And I'm just like, I can't let him go. And he was to the point where he's costing like $9. I'm like, I'm keeping him. I don't care. He's going to do it this year. $9 isn't that much. <laughs> For uh, yeah. a 187, one home run season is too much, no. in my opinion. Yeah. 
but I get, I get, I get burned on these guys all the time. And it, uh, I mean, you can, you can punt strikeouts and still win. I punt strikeouts all the time. I don't even pay attention, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and I just let them pile up and I play as many games as I possibly can. So I can get all the other counting stats mm -hmm. every week, but you can punt strikeouts, but the players who are going to strike out, you know, like I have a Cody, Cody Bellinger, for example, um, if they're going to strike out, that's fine, but they also got to do a bunch of the other stuff. And that, that might be Lewis Prince's problem. Yeah. And I was, yeah, so it, it, there was no, there was no pop uh, in this game. It was just a whole lot of singles to keep him above 100 batting average. I watched yeah. him. It was tough. I don't know. I hope you're doing well, Lewis, wherever you are. Uh, I think he's still on their roster, isn't he? He's not, no did he get sent down? I don't know. I don't know. I, I have Google check. Okay. All right. You, yeah, you check. Um, he's got to be. <laughs> he is. Yeah. He played. He pl I, that's Lewis. what I thought. Keep All right. Do your thing, buddy. He runs like the wind, man. He does. Um, <laughs> the uh, so how do you remember how you found out about the league? I ask everybody this question because I'm kind of fascinated. No one has come up with a really good serendipitous story yet. I mean, yeah. and I don't have one either. But no, I can't remember the exact timing of uh, up and in the podcast. Right. It's in 2010 of, to 2012. Yeah, so that I only know this because I downloaded all the episodes and like I had them. Yeah, that's oh, the only did? reason I remember. Yeah, that's cool. Because so, that was like my the prime of being. Well, sh might as well say it. it was the prime of being a Cubs fan too. Because sure. at that time, no one was watching. You know, I, I was watching the games every day, but I was just so involved with the prospect scene and you know Parks and Goldstein were just like. It was an era when podcasts were like still really new to me, at least. Sure. I was, I was, you know, like a yeah. sophomore or junior in college at the time. Mm -hmm. And just all the hear, time in the world. <laughs> yes. All the time <laughs> in the world doing nothing. But I was just uh, so like intrigued at the way that uh, Parks, especially, I mean, I, I'm sure you remember his tweets about like Lindor and over sexualizing it all. And yeah. And I Darvish just it, sweating honey. And there were a bunch <laughs> yeah. of them. I remember, you know, don't quote me on one, but it was something like the neighbors uh, came over and wondered why I was screaming so loud. It was something to do with a Lindor defensive play. And it was just like, it was just so very, it was the beginning of Twitter too, when Twitter was all about, you know, weird people and doing weird things. And yeah. I, I, you know, I think I just, I was part of that group just to see people talking. And then I was like, yeah, Dynasty League, this sounds great. And, you know, I don't have any other really information besides that, but I was, you know, that first year, especially, I remember like reading every single thing I could to try and like get off on the right foot, but. Yeah. And I, I remember crash putting the rules out there and it was like a nine page word document. Yeah. And it was just this kind of stream of consciousness, like just thing. And, you know, <laughs> he's, he, he'd like gone through all of it and, I was, I was trying to get more information out of him about like, you know, how did you come up with this? Why did you decide this? And he's just like, I don't know, man, just seemed like it, you know, he's a yeah. creative guy and um, you know, he just sort of did it. And, you know, we've, we've refined a few of the rough edges over the years, I think. And we're probably going to refine some more if some of our owners have their way, but yeah. Um, yeah, I know. I mean, just seeing a post in a Facebook group and, and clicking on, yes, you know, please subscribe me to your newsletter is uh <laughs> you know, no, you know, no one is, uh, I, I anticipate that's how everybody's um, going to be. Um, but, uh, it just, I have to ask. And, um, you know, that podcast, uh, that podcast is still fondly remembered today. I mean, now Kevin Goldstein has been raised from the dead as we know, yes. and is back in the world of the living and doing a podcast that is not the same thing, but I mean, it's, you know, it's entertaining. I actually have been meaning to get to more episodes. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's just, um, it's, it's good to have him back. It's a little bit of deja vu. Um, I'm still going to drop, I'm still going to drop Kevin an email and see if I can get him to read it about our crazy league and how it's still going. And, and, uh, cause there were multiple fantasy leagues that came out of that fan group. Yeah. And I think this is the only one that remains. The fan group's actually still there. And people still post about mattresses oh. or, or yeah. Texas or, you know, chili being, only allowed to be meat and you know all that other <laughs> all the other Crazy memes stuff. they're still going yeah i mean not a lot but they're there you know the yeah. thing this stuff's got a long tail man anyway so um yeah and i yeah and i'd never played i'd never played dynasty baseball either um i'd never won anything um you know then i win the league the first year and i was like holy shit <laughs> what did i do yeah oh i know God. and so um 
and I'm not listen. And I've, I've, I, I keep pointing this out. I know, but um, I, I'm in another fantasy league that includes my brother, but has nobody else in common with this league. And it's a pay league. They pay money every year. And I am horrible in this league. I won second place one time out of four years. Other than that, the money's gone straight down the drain. I think I finished 10th last year or ninth. I tried really hard too. And in fact, in some ways I try harder than I do in this one. Mm-hmm. It's like, there's money. You know, it's my child's college funds on the line and I can't, and I just can't do it. And the scoring's a little bit different. It's on Yahoo. Um, you know, it's, but it's roughly the same thing. It's head to head every week, you know, and yeah. uh, they do a little auction online auction at the beginning of every year. There's three keepers, you know, I mean, so it's different. Um, but I'm, I just, I'm bad. I can't do it. Everything, everything that I try in, in up and in works and everything I try in that league fails. And it's just so weird. Why does this fantasy, happen? I don't know. I think fantasy baseball is the hardest one to play out of all I've played all of them other than sure. basketball. I don't think I've, done I think that. I've only ever played football other than so, this, so. See, but like in, for example, in football, uh-huh. you know that they're going to throw the ball to whoever, right. I'm a Vikings fan. So say Justin Jefferson, right. You know, he's going to get his opportunities, you know, like you can, it's almost, you know, there t- don't get me wrong. It takes skill to win it, but uh, any given week in baseball, your team could hit 500 or 200, you know? And it's like, they're going to give the ball to Adrian Peterson 25 times on Sunday, you know? Yeah. And almost every time. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, it just seems to me, and I, I and it's kind of the opposite for me. I'm in two other leagues mm-hmm. and I can, you know, put together a team that I know will do well just because it's based on one year where in our league, it's so confusing because, you know, a football roster can get flipped over in three years, no problem, oh, yeah. whatever. You might have a guy on your roster for six years and he, you know, he might not even make the, you know, he might not be in the majors yet, you know? So right. it's just, it's so difficult to me. And yeah, this is why I, I always, I always kind of look, um, look funny at the people drafting these uh, 16 year olds, 16 year old Latin American signees, you know, <laughs> I mean, Jason Dominguez or somebody who's got a name that people yeah. know because he's number one on that list um, is one thing. But some of these other guys, like a couple of the guys drafted in our last draft. So I, I didn't have any idea who the person was. Who the <laughs> was. And it's like, I oh, he just that. signed with the A's a month ago. He's going to be 17 in five months. And it's like, you know, yeah. do you, I know it's only costing you a dollar or two dollars or whatever, but like you, you that's a space that there's yeah. a space there and he's going to be in it. You know, yeah. what are you going to, where are you going to be in six years? You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Very good point. I, I try to always I don't know. pick guys in the draft who are going to show up as soon yeah. as possible. Yeah. Me too. Even me too. if, because after, you know, after the first round, you're taking a shot just as much, especially in this last draft you had where there was literally no information about 80% of the players. It was like, yeah, well, he pitched pretty good last year. Yeah. Ke- it's I, like, okay. You Keith, know, Law, like, Keith Law was talking about his top 100 and he's like, He's like, I didn't see anybody in person last year. So yeah. half of my half of my player comments are like, well, in 2019, he was pretty good. <laughs> yeah, like, <laughs> you know, it's so, it's so and, random. And, and-, and you're seeing it this year. Um, now the minor leagues have just started here in 2021. And, you know, there are guys, there are guys in the red system that were, sk- you know, skipped up a, a two levels. Yeah, it, It's like the club pretended they played, you know, <laughs> they might've played 2019 at low a, and then they, pre- the club's like, well, we didn't play in 2020, but maybe we're going to assume you played high a and you were pretty good. So now you're in double a, you know, to keep them on the schedule. Yeah. Yeah. Like, okay. You know? And maybe uh, they got really first? good. You know, our, the, the Reds opening day, second baseman, Jonathan India, who was a first round draft pick. So it wasn't like he was off the radar, but, um, yeah he made the club kind of out of nowhere and he hadn't played above a ball and they're like, Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, he was really awesome at the alternate site last year. And it's like, well, what the hell does that mean? He hit the ball. Like he, it's just endless batting practice. Right. Or like, you know, (laughs) they play these kind of like little games. It's the sit you're playing against the same people every, you know, I don't know, but apparently, and then, then he's in the opening day lineup and and here he is. Yeah. And I mean, you know, he's doing all right. Uh, He started off really fast and he cooled off a whole lot, but. (laughs) <laughs> as, do, as do most prospects and he looks like jack sparrow um he does a little bit actually <laughs> that's just the guy who stood out to me like he was kind of from left field because nobody you know it wasn't like he was on the top of all the lists in fact he was being kicked out of all the top 100s because he wasn't that good mm-hmm. uh, in 2019 even so 
I don't know. I just, um, it is really fun to follow all those prospects though. And, um, you know, that becomes the most work I do as an owner every year is get print out a bunch of top 100s, print out the one from the athletic, print out the one from baseball America, print out the one, and then like cross off who's not available, mm -hmm. you know, cause that's the hardest thing. It's like, who's actually available because, you know, people are picking everybody who was on the list last year. So then you're really only looking at guys who were first round picks the year before, or guys who had just jumped up the list. So only about 40 or 30 of those hundred guys are available. So then you have to keep track of those. And, you know, um, you, you admitted to me, I, I was looking through our um, chats on discord before this, and you admitted to me that your draft board this year was Ed Howard and pray for rain. Yes. Pretty much. So talk about Ed Howard for a minute. I wanna... You didn't even get Ed Howard. Am I right? Or did you no, get No, I got him. You got we, him. Okay. We I got couldn't... Ed Howard. He was secured day one. <laughs> I think pick what, what I have three or four or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, he, uh, he went to my high school, which is a, oh. uh, a small all boys school in Chicago. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I'd known about him kind of like, you know, the 16 year old Dominican, I'd known about it. Like I've heard about him for, you know, three or four years when he was 15 or 16. And just the fact, like, I thought he was, you know, I was going to follow his career no matter what happened or whether we picked him or not or, but then for him to get picked by the Cubs was like the coolest thing ever just to have, like, you know, it felt like it was 2000, 11 again and we just gotten Baez and I'd heard about mm -hmm. I remember the day uh, the Cubs picked Baez there was a story well obviously you heard about the neck tattoo that was like the first of uh, the MLB oh, logo on his on I was his oh was Baez drafted yes he was okay so yeah he, went, he was because he played high school high school in Florida oh and, okay uh, I was gonna say maybe he was I, I thought maybe he was Puerto Rican I don't I don't remember exactly I believe yes he is but okay, he played so his high school Puerto Ricans go in Miami. The draft. Right. Okay. Yeah. He put, yeah. So he played in Miami, but I remember like hearing a story about how like he th like hit a bomb and then like threw the bat at the opposing coach or, you know, it was just one of those things that you're like, yeah. you know, who is this guy? Like, I got to hear more about him. He's got an MLB logo on tattoo on the back of his neck. He's 17 years old, you know? And just like, if it feels like that again, where it's, mm -hmm. you know, like that, uh, just that excitement, just, pure excitement about, you know, a kid who's going to be, you know, now it's different, but a kid who would have been playing in South Bend, Indiana, you know, uh, on a random night in a minor league stadium and uh, hopefully, you know, see how his career goes. But now that I can follow him a lot closer, it's uh, it's really cool. So, you know, sitting at the bottom, you got, you got to have guys that you really like. And, sure. you know, maybe, you know, we look back a few years later and there's someone who's taken ninth who is, you know, lighting the world on fire but i would rather have ed howard more than <laughs> i mean so. it's not like he's not a good player and a good yeah. prospect i mean it wasn't like he was a seven he was a a, a yeah. fifth round pick and you like reached all the way down to the, you know, <laughs> yeah, I mean, in the first round that would have been aggressive but. yeah right so well so yeah i mean i i uh, i think that's really great that um you were talking about how the now we, i don't remember which years it was but those years before the cubs um basically got good i mean these yeah and they were they were very bad for several years this it was like the tanking stage so those that was years. happening and they were getting those prospects Baez and people like that in the early in the early tens mm -hmm. and so then that coincided i think that's really neat and if, if you think about it it's a good thing that it was uh we're in the the decade we're in i mean these decades not that that's actually last decade i guess yeah. um but in the 1980s you wouldn't have been able to do that you wouldn't have had all this information available exactly I and mean, you might you might buy the preview magazine from the you know your mom would get it for you from the grocery store and you know there'd be a list of prospects in there and that would be like all your information you wouldn't be able to get the minor league box scores you wouldn't be able to listen to a podcast where prospect dudes talk about prospects and yeah. taxes and other things and you know you wouldn't none of this would happen and you wouldn't be in the league so. Oh yeah, for sure. And that's kind of what I was talking about. It was all kind of a perfect storm at that time because, yeah. you know, you would listen, no disrespect to our major radio and TV or whatever, but they don't really know no. anything that's going on. And it was, and like, yeah, the Cubs are bad and I, I would watch them. It's not fun to watch the major league games. They suck, right? I mean, they, yeah. lose, they were losing 90 games and stuff. That, that's not a good year. I'm well familiar with losing 90 games. Don't worry. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and like I said, podcasts were really just becoming a thing right then. So then like all of a sudden you just had a guy who was like just in love with hobby bias as you were, who was just like, he was like, Oh yeah. Last week I was up at, you know, Tennessee. I saw him play and you know, like all this stuff. And it was just such like a, 
a unique thing at the time to just like, because that's all I cared about, A, but also that it, that was the first time I'd really heard anything like that. And it was just such a cool niche, niche thing that uh, it's hard to replicate. You know, I'm sure there's an 18 year old kid right now who's in love with, you know, some prospect and he's like going through that right now. Not that there was no one ever to talk about it, but it was just like all kind of streamlined into that, uh, into yeah, those years. I get you. I think, um, you know, I, I think that the, um, yeah, following the prospects is a really neat way of, I was, I was thinking of, it's like you have to pivot your fandom because the major league team can be painful to watch for long stretches, you know? Um, and so you look at, you know, well, what, what might happen in the future? And, you know, especially, you know, before the Cubs finally pulled off their title, you know, they were, uh, and especially in the time in between the Red Sox doing away with their curse. And then when the Cubs finally getting off the, the championship schneid, so to speak, they, you know, they were like the only ones <laughs> for, you know, a hundred plus years. And it was like, yeah. you know, I gotta, and, you know, just think about it though. There, there are probably millions of Cubs fans who just tuned out and then tuned back in just in time for the title, you know? Which probably would have been a better idea. Well, I mean, it, I mean, if you I'm know, kidding. what I'm are you going to do? You're going to learn, you know, you're going to read War and Peace in its original Russian yeah. or whatever. I mean, like, is it, what are you what are you going to do with your time? You know, exactly. like something productive. You yeah, know, and that's yeah. I love those years almost as much as anything because there was no pressure, and if you know one guy had a good game or whatever, you're like, all right, that's cool, you know, or you'd come back and you went on a walk-off. I remember Joe Madler had a single against the Cardinals, like walk off against them in like 2010 or something like that. And I was so excited. Like, I was like, let's go, you know, like knowing, but not really knowing how, you know, like how much, like none of these guys were going to be here for more than a year or two. Right. Right. They were just the guys brought in to fill space. Some of them. Yeah. The Nate Shearholtz's the, yeah. The Joe Mathers. Yeah. God, so many of them, but that was just as fun because it, there was no pressure where in like, you know, if, you know, Brian started his career hop, but like when things were, you know, you didn't really know you were at the crunch time and say 2015, 16 going forward, 17, you know, and they like every game and every cold streak was like, Oh, this is bad. Blah, blah, blah. Like we need, is this going to be good enough for like this and that where it was a lot more free, and just like, all right, go out and play, you know, and do whatever yeah, you winning's want. Winning's a bonus. <laughs> yeah. And it was, I really enjoyed that. And yeah, just because it was, yeah, just so chill. And I don't know. I look back on those Cubs teams with a lot of fun memories, despite, yeah. you know, losing a lot. But <laughs> we might be heading there soon again here in a year or two. I don't know. But ah, boy, I don't know. It's hard to imagine. It's, I mean, you think they have so many resources available to them. It's just that their owners don't seem to want to spend any of those resources because yeah. reasons. And mm. I, I don't know what they are exactly. Um, well, I'll, I'll tell you a couple of the reasons. Uh, they, the Ricketts took all the money and bought right. all the property around Wrigley Field. Okay. So yeah, I think I, yeah. I, I know I don't know I don't know the city planning right but he owns a lot of that and that's where okay. a lot of the money has gone where I feel you know this year spending money whatever different story but it felt like for a few years especially post 2016 mm -hmm. that they were another 10 or 15 million dollars into the bullpen into a couple other guys that would have really made them true you know, front runners again, whereas I don't really feel like that's been the case since they won the series and it's cost them multiple times. And then trading Darvish after this year was a complete or after last year was just like a complete sellout, which mm -hmm. I understand, you know, I, I can't speak to they the didn't get, They didn't get anybody they could really point to as yeah. like, well, listen, this guy's going to be just as good as him. So. And Davies is a, you know, he's not been good to start off, but oh, I know I've got him on my team. Yeah. <laughs> He got tattooed. He's gotten tattooed a couple times. Over yeah, I think every time, to be honest with you. But it, but it's just it, the trade was not a baseball trade. It was a, I don't want to pay this guy whatever his salary was last year, and he was he. It wasn't like he was on the uh, top. They got him under uh, under market value coming off of that uh, game seven for LA, which <clears throat> Houston. Thank you very much for that. But uh, it you know and. I, again, I can't speak to his finances. I, you know, I don't know what the heck's going on right there, but 
it's pretty disheartening to see the Chicago Cubs, which I mean, print money. They absolutely print money in and around the ballpark. Mm-hmm. You're lying if they don't. I mean, they have, you know, the best setup, you know, Oh yeah. on this side of the Mississippi. And it just feels like at times that they're not playing to that. And, you know, I'll give them a pass. The whole COVID thing, you know, I don't know what's going on. So, but the yeah. next, this off season and then the next three or whatever will be a very, uh, very telling time for the, uh, for the ownership, but yeah, I, uh, it's been very frustrating because I felt like they were, they were like 2017 was, they were a really good team and they were, but they like, they skimped out on the bullpen and it's just, they were relying on Wade Davis for everything. And it just felt like, you know, what's another $8 million like, to pick up a guy. I, you know, I can't give you a name because that was four or five years ago, whatever, but it just felt like, it wasn't like I was asking for another U Darvish contract. I was asking yeah, the for bullpen guys are easier to find. There's more of them and they, they, you know, they're a little more, they're a little less consistent, but of, of the major parts of your team, that's the easiest one to rebuild. And it's just, yeah. And I understand the concept of like, you know, guys are going to flip flop and maybe it's not smart to invest, but when you're in a championship run spending, you know, an extra this, that, and the other dollar, to fill out a team, to make them a true competitor rather than a fringe competitor just felt like so nickel and dimey to me where yeah. I would totally understand if they were going through a rebuilding period and they're not going to resign or they're not going to sign a U Darvish or they're not going to, but th- that's what I'm talking about trading him in the middle of this whole thing. And it, yes. I don't know. I just, I know that I know for a fact that that trade was not made by Jed Hoyer and the G and the baseball people in the, you know, yeah. in the front office, they said, this guy's available, give us your best offers. And that was the best offer I'm sure that came in. And they just took it because he didn't want, you know, he wanted to cut down payroll because I mean, there's only 5,000 people in the ballpark, but I just can't <laughs> fathom how you don't have a, like reserves of money at this point from the Chicago Cubs franchise, the money they must've made off the 2016 world series had to have bought them half, half the neighborhood. So I, you know, it's hard for me to have uh, sympathy for the Rays yeah. family. So, yeah. well, you know, bringing up you, Darvish, um, leads us to a topic that um, we d- discussed in detail, um, and it involves a certain theory that you have, oh, um, yes. and it, it's not about you, Darvish, actually. Well, but to be it fair, Darvish, if he would have never came at my boy, you. This would have never happened. Okay. I, yeah, I'll just say that. You're, you're referring to Milwaukee Brewers outfielder Christian Yelich. Yes. Now, listen, I want to say for any poss- for any employers or future <laughs> employers or anybody, um, you Christian know. Christian himself. <laughs> yeah, or Mr. Yelich, who is a fine gentleman. I mean, yeah, we'll go with that. Yeah. Um, That's fine. We're, we're having fun here, okay? But it is – it is very intriguing um, what you uh, what you believe about this. So now let's go into this. It starts well. It came up um, in 2019. Well, first of all, Yelich, of course, um, was dominant in 2018 and 19. Turned into a superstar after Milwaukee got him from the Marlins um, and offloaded a bunch of guys who I don't believe have done squat pretty much. Yeah. Um, they had a guy who struck out a gazillion times and uh, I'm trying to think they were, I, I don't remember if any, um, I don't think I send Diaz has done anything really. No. no. Yeah. Uh, I was, I was talking about, um, Monty Harrison. Monty Harrison hasn't done that much. Um, I don't know if anybody does anyway. So Yelich, then he goes from being a good player to being a superstar when he goes to Milwaukee and he wins the MVP in 19, right? Or is it 18? One of those years. Yeah, I think it might have been 18, but yeah, whatever. I, and then him or Trout flipping. Right. Years, and he's, like, and he's now years. got a nine year contract, which he signed at the end of 2019. And mm-hmm. you have, well, okay, why don't you just tell us? Why don't you, why don't you just tell everybody what you think? It, it's, and, it's hard to, uh, yeah, you know, or what I'm you not, suspect. Uh, it's, I'm not Judge Judy here. I can't like no. present this in a, uh, official. yeah, that's also, it's a TV show. So, yeah. <laughs> You're telling me Judge Judy isn't a real judge. (laughs) (laughs) I know. I know. I'm just, yeah. So I don't have the numbers here, but uh, actually let's start from the beginning, which made me, which is what made me suspicious about the whole thing. And I'm sure people kind of, uh, right. Uh, remember this, but that's that 
at that time, whether it's that summer, I think it must have been the off season. Because uh, the, they're both yes, on because the t- the tweet that you sent the well, it was not a tweet. It was an article on Hardball Talk, uh, yeah. RIP, um, from November of 2019. Yes. So and yes. Well, you Darvish, very active on Twitter. One of yeah. my favorite pitchers long before he came to the Cubs. He, right. you know, when when he signed yeah. with, I have a I have a tweet out there from like 2011. I retweeted back when he was sweating it. honey, right? Of course. <laughs> yes. Sweet honey. And uh, I've always been a big you Darvish guy. I love the way he pitches. I love how much he loves the game and stuff. Yep. And he was talking. A Cubs fan asked him about why he was stepping off the mound when Yelich was at bat, and he Yelich said or Darvish said that. When they were, you know, when he came to his set and he was about to throw, Yelich looked down towards the bullpen, and that's why he stepped off. He didn't say yes. anything else. He's like, I don't think he did anything, but that's why I did what I did in this clip that you sent me. Mm-hmm. And then professional athlete Christian Yelich, who has m- multi- hundreds of millions of dollars now coming into his bank account, mm-hmm. felt that it was that time that he would quote tweet him and say to the lines of, nobody needs help facing you as in you you Darvish. Right. And I just thought that was the most ridiculous response. And he said, be better than this. Yeah, be better than this. Nobody needs yeah. help facing you. To a guy, to you Darvish. And I, I just, it woke me up. I was like, what professional athlete would go on Twitter? It's rather insecure of him. Yeah, it just, and it, it just made me really you know, kind of, it perked my ears up a lot because okay, it, yeah. like, again, like, has that, you know, I can't think of an example like that ever on social media where a player would blatantly attack a guy, you know, like calling him out for something. I mean, that was, someone something could publish that a like book a, on Trevor yeah. Bowers online life, but I mean, <laughs> yeah, sorry. Well, it's like, I don't need to go. He's not on Trevor my team Bowers. anymore. The hell with him. Anyway, go yeah. ahead. <laughs> he, and it just felt really weird. So, and I'd always felt, you know, the whole sign, you know, sign stealing, whatever scandal has been going on. I was with the, really, with I was, the Houston Astros. Well. Yes. Yes. And I was super intrigued by that. I wasn't really on the uh, original, you know, I wasn't waving the pitchforks calling for these guys heads after one little thing, but I was just super intrigued as to the discovery of all of it. And that guy who was, you know, audio or mapping the audio levels of each game and just like all the data that was coming out. And it just, it was really interesting for me to read about. I wasn't, oh, you yeah. know, I wasn't like out there. To Somebody's crucify... going to write a book. I mean, yeah. I can't believe there haven't been any books already. Well, I think um, that'll come in 20 or I mean, 30 years. We've seen some of the already. detailed articles about, you know, like I said, the guy did the thing with the audio and, you know, all the different ways the Astros pulled it off. And it's actually very simple what they did. And it was really just a matter of coordinating it and, yeah. You know, and, and of course, our good friend Kevin Goldstein has nothing to do with it whatsoever, which I I believe Kevin. that part of it. Um, I don't. I, I'll, it'd, I'll be hard to ima- I'd, it'd be hard to imagine that he didn't have some idea, though. The, the thing is, and I, I would say this to anyone, is if you gave me a, a year, say I was employed by the Cubs, and you mm-hmm. said, you know, for this year, uh, we're going to cheat and we're going to need the best ways that we could do it. You could come up with a ton of examples in baseball, yeah. Because it is a game where it's uh, not that it's prevalent, but it, it, the opportunities are there if you. There's lots for of it. little little things you can do. You know? Yes, and, and I don't think it's that you know obscene yeah. or whatever. I mean, I'm not even here if to... it's just look, even if when you come to bat, looking back at the catcher signs. You yeah, know? I mean they just know. Fernando Tatis Jr. was just accused of doing that like a couple yeah. of days ago. Exactly, and I don't think it's out of you know out of the realm. What the gray line, you know that's out there. You can, this is bad. This is good, whatever. But I had always felt, especially during that 20, 26, 2017, 18, 19 Milwaukee Brewers teams that it just, it's almost undescribable, but in the same way as when the Astros would be playing and they would just hit bombs and every single at bat Yelich was just sending balls to the moon. And I don't have the number in front of me, but I believe he has had the highest batting average in modern modern era on fastballs in 2018 or 19. I don't, you know, okay. don't quote me on that, whatever. I don't have, I, know I don't have this information up at the time. And it just really, that, that tweet really just like sent me down this like rabbit hole of like, you know, 
we're, you know, and this isn't just Christian Yellis, but the Milwaukee Brewers kind of like, you know, what were they doing down there? And I said to myself, like, it would be super easy to steal those signs, have a guy in your bullpen at Wrigley Field that's down there. The video that they were talking about was, you know, at, was at Wrigley. So all you have to do is look down. If you're a left-handed batter, you know, mm-hmm. it's right there. And if you had a guy who was giving you a sign, you know, fastballs coming, whatever, you picked up the signs of the pitches, it's not that insane to do. Right. That can and, you happen can, with, and, you, and you have plausible deniability so you can say you're looking for a sign from the first base, from the coach or yeah, and, you know, you somebody know, else. How yeah. could you really pinpoint it? And at the time, I think, like you said, it's not going to come out for a while because everyone's still in the majors yeah. and there's a code, you know, about all how all this stuff should go down. But yeah, I, you know, true statement, I'm sorry, but I truthfully believe with all my heart the Milwaukee Brewers in general were stealing signs just as much as the Houston Astros during that time period. Okay. Whether that could have been many teams, you know, we've heard about the Yankees. We've heard about this, that, and the other. Yeah. The Red Sox, right? Yes. Red Sox and got penalized for some there, stuff. But all those guys from Milwaukee and besides Yelich have now left since left Milwaukee, the, uh, I'm blanking on the catcher, Mus- Grandal, Moustakis. Moustakis is on the Reds now. Yeah, yeah, and all these guys kind of left at the same time where Yelich got the thing. And, again, Christian Yelich is a good baseball player. He was mm-hmm. probably going to hit, you know, 280 with 20 home runs every single year if he would have stayed in Miami, went to, went to Milwaukee, wherever. He's a good baseball player. Mm-hmm. But if Christian Yelich, the guy who can, knows when a fastball is coming – probably can hit like Mike Trout when he doesn't know a fastball is coming. So it just was a very strange thing. And then we come back for 2020 and, you know, bad season, whatever. And I mean, the guy looked completely lost at the plate and not in the way that always oh, swing planes off. It looked like he didn't know what pitches weren't coming anymore. And again, that's just me confirming biases, whatever this, yeah, that, and the it's other. It's true. It's, it's a bit of confirmation bias. But, no, he's not you know, anymore. He sucks now. Yeah. It, no. it just was a strange thing how the greatest hitter of the last two years in the National League then then hit 200. He was hitting like 150 for the first couple months or the first, what did we play, 65 games? I'd say 20 games. He started to hit better, you know, towards the end of it. But, you know, again, I'm not here to write a book about I think Christian Yelich should be burned at the stake because, you know, he's this bad of a person. I just have a lot of thoughts and notions about him. I mean, it's, it's, I don't think there'd be anybody who would disagree with the fact that just because the Astros got caught and they weren't banging on trash cans anymore, that that meant that the cheating scandal or or that cheating in major league baseball is now over. And it was, yeah. And it was just that like, that wasn't the time where no one's getting caught. The feds intercept one big boat full of cocaine. All right. Well, the war on drugs is over. We won. You know, that's not how it works. Yeah. So like all these were happening and it, you know, with what, whatever team you you want to blame it. If the Cubs came out tomorrow and there was a scandal that was released, I would write it down the same way because yeah. everyone was kind of doing it. And, you know, whether that's on Major League Baseball, whether that's on the code between the players, this, that, and the other, I, I'm not in a position to say this yeah. is right, this is wrong. You're a bad person. You're a good person. But cheating was running rampant during this time period. The Milwaukee Brewers, who get no no attention – like from the yeah. media, from the national right. media, any of this stuff. Yeah. Like that's Milwaukee for you. <laughs> yeah. I also don't really like Wisconsin as a whole state, but that's, <laughs> that has nothing to do with this at this time. And yeah. That, you know, they had a bunch of guys who were kind of, you know, a decent team who turned into a game away from the pennant and were a really good team for two years during this, you know, cheating scandal. And then all of them leave again. And, you know, they got some great pitchers now and things might change for them, but yeah, it's true they do. Those two years, every single guy on their team was hitting 20 home runs. Mm-hmm. Every, you know, it was just – and you go up there and it would be like, yeah, let's just, just hit another one and another one and another one. And you're like, I know this guy's a good player, but holy Christ, like, yeah. this is just insane. And again, I it wouldn't have even been personal until he sent that you Darvish tweet. And I was like, you're going to call it another professional in, the, in this matter on a, a public forum – you know, like you're supposed to be, you know, at this point when that tweet was sent, he was pretty much the talisman of the NL, like how Trout has the AL. Mm -hmm. And it just seemed like such a strange thing that it made me really, you know, question all that stuff. And again, 
if it if it came out tomorrow that every team was cheating, I wouldn't like baseball any less. Like I, I would I would cheat for my team if they if they paid me twenty grand a year and said help the Chicago Cubs cheat. I would because it is what it is, and if they're gonna allow it, well, it's, I mean, it falls on the Rob Manfred and all them. You probably wouldn't be able to live right around Wrigley Field though, because that no. butthead Ricketts would charge way too much rent. But uh... <laughs> I'd live in the attic. And I live in some crawl space. Just give me yeah. a sleeping bag. In the a, storeroom at the at the Billy Goat Tavern, right? Yeah. Give me a monitor so I can play Xbox at night. And, <laughs> uh, yeah, give me a sleeping bag and some Red Bull. And uh, okay. um, I'll do whatever you say because at the end of the day, it's about winning baseball games. And, you know. Yeah. That may and, be right there. You may have just sketched out a movie starring Zach Galifianakis or somebody <laughs> like that. Or, well, I, think, uh, I think we have better people. As Patton life. Oswald or somebody like that. Yeah. yeah. Anyway. Yeah. yeah. I, well, okay. So it's an interesting theory. I mean, you know, you're right. I mean, Yelich has, has never been. Um, and I, I would, I mean, we, we all know it that, you know, other folks are doing it from time to time and it's, yeah, what's, it's, I haven't looked at how he's doing this year. Yeah. I was, I was going to say, um, I was thinking about this issue in relation to what pitchers do as well. Um, mm -hmm. You know, Trevor Bauer, who we mentioned earlier, uh, has had a, had a lot of opinions about that. Um, and there was the whole thing about, um, you know, the league is going to try to supposedly police um, pitchers who are using the, um, what is it, like the pine tar or whatever to get better yeah. grip and make, make the ball spin more, I believe, right? Mm -hmm. yeah it's all about the, the yeah and you know spin rate. spin rate has become a much bigger thing um and you know so then bauer so far if i'm not mistaken bauer's the only pitcher this year to get accused of doctoring the ball they took a bunch of balls they they didn't stop the game or anything you know he pitched the game they took all the balls after the game and then honestly i don't know i maybe i missed it i don't even know what happened anything out they didn't put anything out so um and ahead. But it's the same thing, like, and, and Bauer is basically like, yeah, 80% of pitchers are doing this. Mm -hmm. And pretty obviously he's doing it. I mean, you yeah. know, I mean, he's a very talented pitcher, but, you know, I mean, he's been very up and down in his career. He's probably tried some things and not tried some, it's like what's happened to Christian Yelich, right? Mm -hmm. You know, he's been pretty up and down. Um, and the ups have been real up and the downs have been pretty down. I mean, you know, look at Bauer in 2019 and Bauer in 2020. Yeah. So, but it's... um and with with that particular situation, like I don't know how you police that. If if I don't know how you police any situation where everybody's doing it. If if all the batters are looking at the catcher's signs, or if all the batters are getting tipped off by somebody in the bullpen, you know, I'm just hypothetically speaking. Like, yeah. At that point, if everybody's doing it, honestly, the only thing you can really do is 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 make some version of it legal. Mm -hmm. You know, like MLB could. Be, <laughs> the joke was, you know, MLB could just make more money. Um, by having an official grip product licensed yeah. by MLB <laughs> and okay, pitchers are allowed to use this, but you're not allowed to, you're not allowed to do this yeah. and that you're not allowed to use, you know, sticky tack or, or whatever else you just, you have to use the officially sanctioned MLB grip product. Yeah. That um, be fine. And that would actually, and then it's like, okay, well, cause I, and you know, that, it, when you first hear that, it sounds kind of nuts, but it actually, <laughs> I've actually thought about it a lot. And actually, I, th I think that's really what they should do. Yeah. Um, you, that's, you that's a, a line. I, I'd never heard that before, but yeah, I would 100% you, you draw a line and say, all right, this is not okay. You know, mm -hmm. you're not going to be able to stand out there with a razor blade and slash the ball up, you know, yeah. or whatever. Yeah. I mean, you know, micro or something. <laughs> yeah. Or Gaylord Perry. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, when they outlawed this, uh, I remember reading this um, before in the days before baseball reference, the only way you could get baseball stats on demand was through the baseball encyclopedia, right? Big giant paperback book that you got mm -hmm. every year. And you just, I just read it like a book, you know, yeah. just year after year stats. And, you know, there was a whole article in there about the spitter and how in 1920, they said, all right, well, the spitball is now illegal, except these guys, these like 14 pitchers that they determined were the guys that like made their, made their living throwing the spitter. These 14 guys can continue to throw the spitter, but only these 14 guys, it might not have been 14, it might've been nine yeah. or some number. These yeah. guys are allowed to keep doing the spitter. Everybody else is illegal. You're not allowed to throw the spitter anymore. That must have seemed so asinine. I imagine you're some, you know, third year yeah. pitcher trying to hold on in the bullpen. And you, all of a sudden they're like, yeah, we're going to let Gaylord Perry keep throwing it. But you, yeah. no, can't do it. But right. 
at, you know, at some point uh, you got to draw the line and uh, two points, actually going back to Trevor Bauer. I'm, I'm sure I do not need to pu- uh, plug this guy, but uh, foolish baseball, I believe on YouTube made an okay. incredible video about, Trevor I have not Bauer. heard of foolish baseball. I'm, I'm missing. Yeah, he's, a, he's, it's a YouTuber. He does, you know, mm-hmm. tons of, you know, 20, 30 minute videos that are, you know, really informative and he put together pretty much an open and closed book on Trevor Bauer's case about how oh, okay he, I need to watch this this interesting yeah he'd always bragged about how he could get this much on by adding you know adding the you know substance whatever it is he also has created his own substance which I think I did hear that one yeah yeah and like he didn't use it but he'd made one he'd had one worked oh, on I'm sure in the lab. he didn't use it no didn't use it just yeah. didn't use it until well they showed his spin rates and I think you know this now going from this is uh hearsay rather than this is what this guy put together he put together a long video to show you all this stuff but yeah. i would say that he got very frustrated with garrett cole getting 300 million dollars the guy he hated at ucla and <laughs> that's right they were teammates right yeah and yeah. they hated each other and there's this whole thing in there about how you know the quotes about how they just do not I don't care i think for i knew other. that they hated each other okay yeah I knew they were teammates big yeah. time hate okay. and uh and they were saying that I think Trevor just got fed up with it, went out during the COVID season and dealt. I mean, he dealt. And whether, you know, he was he was a mediocre pitcher w- with great stuff for all these years. He'd been up and, and down. He had a couple of really good yeah, years and a couple of like third stuff. Yeah, years. but, you know, the, just being for me being honest, I don't think any of those years were really that good. And I felt like he's one of those pitchers who had the stuff to always be a really good pitcher, whereas some guys – you know, when he, uh, him having a four or five ERA or whatever, let's just go as basic as possible is a lot different than a lot of guys having a four or five ERA because the stuff was always there. And I felt like he always never wanted to cheat in any sort of way. And he kind of just flipped to the dark side <laughs> at some point, you know, last year where they showed all these crazy, the spin rate numbers jumped by four or 500 last year and all this stuff, right. pretty, pretty solid foundation evidence that you could say he was cheating but like as you're talking about his his ball got taken out of play uh yeah this year yeah at the beginning of this year and i think i heard this was i don't know if this was a cubs broadcast or i was watching a different game or whatever and they were saying that they think that they're taking these balls out and not saying anything about any of them because they're doing exactly that where they're saying okay who's using you know a little bit of this a little bit of that and who's using you know like commercial grade stucco you know, I think they're trying right now to kind of uh, draw the line, whereas they're not, you know, like, I'm sure they found something on Trevor Bowers, you know, if not, whatever. The point is, is that they're, they're not saying to these guys, hey, we're taking the balls out. And if you get caught, it's 30 game suspension day one, you know, I think they are looking at all of them. And there's a reason why Trevor Bowers was so publicly taken out. It's because, you know, I don't think the MLB liked what he did last year. I, you know, as a person, I think he's kind of annoying, but again, yeah, do whatever you want. My, my thing last year, and I'm sure you watched his, uh, his vlogs. I thought they were really, I did watch a couple of them. Yeah. I so mean, there was one, uh, I, not, a, I didn't watch them all. Yeah. Well, I, and I, I'm kind of from that generation of millennials of, I, you know, I like watching that stuff. And when they first started doing them, I thought they were super cool. They've never been in an MLB room. All that stuff he did kind of opened it up for, you know, a lot of people to be more free on social media. And he's willing to take the brunt and have yeah. people laugh at him. And I think that's cool and all that stuff. Yeah. But he had the, uh, a vlog last year when they lost in that, you know, the playoff series. Was it a one game playoff? That they played in a best no, of three. No, it was a best of three. And they did, yeah. they failed to score a run in both of the games. <laughs> and he had yeah. his vlog on there. Yeah, and he pitched really well in one of the games. Yeah. And And lost like one to nothing. Yes. And it was, again, do whatever you want, man. I'm not here to criticize you. But in this video, he's basically screaming at Joey Votto while he's in the trading room. He's like on the field after the game. Well, I pitched good. We lost. I couldn't get a hit. And I was just like, this guy cares about himself a lot more than he cares about playing. He he actually, all throughout last year, now, of course, things are going well. You know, when you're winning, everybody's happy. But yeah. Um, the Reds, well, the Reds were underachieved all last year, and then they they went on a streak right at the end of the season and made the wild card by you know this much yeah. and finished like thirty one and twenty nine. Mm-hmm. But 
Bauer, of course, dominated all year. Um, he did also, I saw the stats, he also got to face a whole lot of uh, not very good offenses, including the Brewers. Um, <laughs> Shocking. And, um, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and um, you know, so there, that was part of it too, but um, he was very well liked on the team. Um, you know, I, they would always say, talk about in the Reds press coverage, you know, like, uh, which obviously the Reds press coverage is a, you know, the Cubs press coverage is this much. The Reds press coverage is like this. Yeah. Got, I'd like, rather have it be the small coverage. They've, like, they have like three writers that write about them. <laughs> yeah. um, hey. You know, they've got, um, you know, there's one newspaper and they got the athletic guy and you know, there's like the MLB.com guy. That's basically it. Mm-hmm. And, um, and so then, uh, you know, they're all talking about, oh yeah, Bauer's really dynamic on social media, whatever. And they just would always mention that. And then they would always make it sound like, you know, the, the people on his team, you know, that he was this really great teammate. And I, I do think he kind of lost his shit a little bit in the playoff game last year. I think he, I mean, he knew he was going to free agency. He knew he was 99% likely not coming back. Yeah. Um, I and, just, I just felt like he knows he knows exactly what he's doing with all of social media. He knows how to talk to a writer. He's yeah. not going to be a guy, even if he has a bad game. Uh, yeah. You know, he knows exactly what to say. He's a smart guy, 110%. Mm-hmm. But I thought that some of that stuff he posted crossed the line between a, you're talking about, for example, Joey Votto was the one that, that I thought that was crossing the line completely. Joey Votto spent his entire career in Cincinnati, you know, yeah. I, I can't speak. I'm sure you can, but he's I, universally loved by just yeah. about everyone. I mean, I love the guy, yeah. <laughs> you it's know, hard like, to dislike. I respect, uh, I got really angry. The, the Reds won yesterday, won nothing on a walk-off single, but Votto got hit on the thumb and it, and it got yeah. broken. Dallas mm-hmm. Keuchel hit him on the thumb and he's out for a month. Yeah. And you're, Joey, and he's just mad. a great guy. He's it's just like, like, like trade the game. Give me, give me more Joey Votto. Yeah. You know, he's just I, fun to watch it. Even, even though his skills are, his skills are not what they used to be. I mean, He's, but he's still a great player. You're talking to the guy who just finally cut him this year after all that time. Remember, I had <laughs> I him on my him team. Too. I, I got Rizzo on my team, and I'm not. Leave, he's not leaving until he yeah. leaves Chicago. So, and I held but, on to Votto about a year, at least a year, probably two years too long. So, I mean, ever since he won the MVP, it's been kind of straight with your heart. This is what it's all about. But, but I mean, he was like seventy dollars. I mean, he was he was like a you know a sixth of my entire payroll, and I knew oh, okay. he had to go. I yeah. knew at the time. I knew in two thousand thirteen when I got him because he had already signed the ten year contract by then. Um, mm-hmm. I knew that I was like there is some so many years down the line, some time in like two thousand nineteen or whatever, way off in the future. I'm yeah. gonna have to I'm gonna have to cut this guy. Yeah. It's a matter of when is it gonna be? So I knew it back then. But I felt. And yeah. that just speaks to his status. Yes. And for you to make videos and, you know, yell about this, that, and the other, you know, to get Joey Votto's not on your YouTube channel. He's not going to see that, but I guarantee you someone in the Fred's front office saw that, you know, it's just like, Hey man, like, you know, you know, it's funny you say that I, Votto, Votto goes on the Jim Day pod. Jim Day is the guy who works for the Reds. He does the podcast. So it's, mm-hmm. you know, it's, it's pretty sanitized because he works for the team, but pretty yeah. in-depth interviews with a lot of past foreign players. And he always interviews Votto every year in the off season. And Votto made it a point to say he watched a lot of YouTube. Like what it's like, what did you do in the off season, Joey, when you were under, under lockdown or whatever. And like, yeah. Yeah, apparently he lived with his strength coach and worked out all the time and then watched YouTube all the rest of the time. And it's like, I, he had to have watched some of those Trevor Bauer videos. That's why I thought that was funny when you said that. It, he, he doesn't, I'm sure he didn't, uh, you yeah. know, didn't make a scene. He didn't go on Twitter to talk about it. No, but, I don't even think he tweets. Yeah. I don't know if he does. I haven't Because he's a professional it. athlete and, you know, he knows when to, you know, do this, that, and the other. But I just, I, I was, you know, I'm not a Reds fan, but I thought that was completely crossing the line so so you know you're a one-year rental guy here it just showed me you know yeah. kind of what we all see that it's the trevor bauer show and we're all supposed to you know like and retweet everything he posts and but, you know that but that's the way some players are um yeah. you know i mean you know i the, their ego is what drives them to be great and yeah. that's true of professionals of all walks of life. I mean, I've worked, I've, I've, uh, I've worked in sales support for 20 years. I worked with a bunch of salespeople. I'm married to a salesperson. Uh, I like, you know, <laughs> I'm not talking about my wife. I'm just, um, but I, I think about all the folks that I work with and some of the best, some of the ones who are the best at their job are yeah. pretty much raging egomaniacs. And it's like, you know, you just, you know, that's what you're going to get. And so, you know, I mean, I, you know, I don't think I'm a raging egomaniac, at least not professionally, but, 
you know, I know that I'm going to get the occasional, you know, um, you know, why haven't you done this for me statement? Mm -hmm. (laughs) It's just part of it, but it's like, you know what, this person, this is, this is what drives them to be. So, I mean, ego is like that. Ego makes you great. Um, Some people, not everyone. Uh, Um, There's (laughs) some people, I bet you some people in life have said that about me for sure. You know, over the course of time, like, Oh, he believes this thing in the other, but I think there's just such a fine line that is hard to work where you can believe yourself and this, that, and the other, you know, you can have the most belief in yourself as possible, but to go public and put stuff out, yeah. you know, that's not necessary whatsoever. You know, he, right. it's not like he was going to win an Emmy if he left in this part about this, that, and the other. And it just, you know, you can, when you're on the, when you're on the field, do whatever you want, man, you know, and all the stuff he does, fine. You're, you're playing the game. You're standing in there throwing the the best hitters in the world. Like you got to act the way you got to act. But I just, you know, I think there's a difference between putting out YouTube videos that are, you know, Jake Paul clickbait, you know, material to, for, Mm -hmm. it doesn't seem for any reason, like you got your money, you know, I don't know. I'm sure it was part of some all master plan that he cooked up during COVID. He was sitting there, he's like, you know what? this is the year I'm just going to pop off. Like I'm doing everything. We're doing the YouTube. I'm retweeting everything, you know, and yeah. I'm sure he thought about it all because he wanted to make himself a name. And that's, you know, he was a pitcher in baseball. I mean, I remember him from his Cleveland days. He hates the Cubs because of what 2016 happened. Like for sure hates them. And I don't even need to, <laughs> that was it. Like I watched that in those videos and he would like say things about the Cubs and it would just make me laugh. But I knew who he was before that. He was a cool quirky guy and all that stuff, but it really felt like an organized push because it was his free agency year. And he knew he had pretty much one year to showcase his talent, to get it, you know, to get the deal that he got. And it all worked out. That's great, man. But I don't think Joey Votto, taking shots at Joey Votto, taking shots at this guy and the other was <laughs> necessary in any yeah. slightest bit. And, no. you know, some of the stuff he done, whatever. Do what you got to yeah. do on the field. But it just seems like some of the stuff is just so unnecessary, but yeah, I know. Well, so you have a particular perspective on this. So I'm going to pivot a little bit. You have, you have a a little, a bit of a perspective on this because you happen to do to work in this world professionally. Um, So tell me about, tell me about what it's like being a, what's your official. I I understand that things have been a little different since COVID, but what, what is your official title? uh, And what, what do you really do? what or what would you do i guess in a typical yeah. day as a as a social media um uh having a social media centric job yeah it's so just it's fascinating like, to those of us who entered the workforce before social media was a thing yeah and it's and i think for a lot of older people it's like how can that be a job you know doing things that <laughs> this is the intern tweeting yeah, yeah. so i want i want to hear a little bit about this cuz it's i mean it's a it's a serious i mean you know the company i work for has has a whole social media team you know i mean this mm-hmm. is a thing everybody has yeah. them and they're not going away so yeah it's a uh, it's digital media coordinator for the yeah. uh, st louis blues and i've done that for 7 years since 2013 or so uh coming out of college i'll start with a uh, how it all began. So I, I played yeah. uh, club hockey down at Mizzou okay. uh, for, you know, all four years. And uh, mm-hmm. we, yeah. club the, hockey is really big at my school too. Yeah. I mean, it would, we draw, they draw pretty good crowds. So hockey was not yeah. a big, so it's like club school, uh, which is, you know, first of all, there's not, I guess we can go into this too, but hockey in the NCAA level is, you know, there's 20 teams, there's 30 teams that are playing at an NCAA it's not that level. Many. Yeah. So that, because, and then there's a ton of teams playing at D3 level, but those are at these, you know, Stony Brook, all these very small schools in Wisconsin, New York, wherever. Right. So it's like kind of a weird mix up of kids who I was not a good hockey player in high school. I didn't really like peak till like senior year as like a, as a physically or whatever, this stuff, like I wasn't anything like not a good player, but like, you know, I got older and uh, you know, I was, I loved playing hockey and that's like what I wanted to do. So like I was on this team, but then like I would play with kids who were, you know, a couple different decisions away from being in a minor league team, like guys who were real primetime hockey players, you know? And it's just like, you would play kids like one weekend and be like, Oh yeah, this guy was playing in the USHL and then he flunked out or something. And then like, 
it was just a very wild group of kids and it led to you know we had some games where uh where there was not a single person there besides a couple <laughs> parents but then we played uh you know, Mizzou, Mizzou and Kansas had a long time rivalry, which I didn't really like understand until a few years after being there. But so they, you know, Mizzou went to the SEC and we and uh, Kansas stayed in the Big 12. And we were the first teams to play each other again after like a year or something like that. And we sold out like a 5,000 person arena to play this team with it. You know, like I'm a sophomore high school. I just came from playing. I was an absolute nobody in high school hockey. And all of a sudden you're like stepping on the ice and you feel like, you know, you're in the NHL. Like it was just such yeah, a, no, I, yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> it was such a jarring experience. That drawing's the wrong word. It was the coolest thing ever. Like you would go play, you know, at, at all these different schools. We, you know, we went to Florida, Colorado, all these different places, you know, but we weren't really like, it was just a band of kids who just wanted to play hockey. Like it wasn't like, it was just such a weird thing, but, leading to this whole thing here, the NHL goes on lockout in 2013. Okay. uh, During my senior year and uh, the coach of the blues, I don't know how this all got, all this got like arranged, but the coach of the blues came to one of our practices in another school, uh, Lindenwood university, probably never heard of it, but it's like a local the name's familiar, but I wouldn't be able to put it on a map. There's they, they put a, uh, they put a couple players in the NFL every few years or so. Okay. And mm-hmm. they have a really good like sports program. Like their hockey team is insane. They play like a NCAA D one team. They train weight lift four or five days a week. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're really good. And we, we were able to beat them a couple times, but besides the point, uh, <laughs> they scheduled uh, two of these, like one practice with them and one practice with us. So we drove up to St. Louis to go do this whole thing and afterwards the uh there's like this bar right next to this arena and they invited all the seniors and uh the coaches and we went and had like a couple beers with ken hitchcock who's like the second or third all-time most winning coach in the nhl at the time you know this is i'm 21 you know just go to hockey games like this is the coolest thing and uh, they, they brought their website guy there. To, they're doing a little story on it. And I was just like, hey, I'm in journalism school, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, you know, come down for a game if we ever get the season going. And we'll kind of like show you what we do and everything. So I did that. Uh, season comes back a couple weeks later. Do a little, you know, one day thing. Keep in touch with the guy. And then he gives, I get an internship for that next season. Mm-hmm. So I just, I hadn't finished school. I still had like a few hours. I should have finished up over the summer. But I mean, wasn't really a big school guy and uh <laughs> this is like an opportunity i'm like see ya like i'm out and i drove down the highway and moved to the like moved into the first town that's like close to st louis clayton and uh interned there for a year and then after that got this job as digital media coordinator and i mean i've done pretty much everything under the sun that they've ever asked like i've never done like sales or anything like that but i mean like I've dressed up as the mascot when our mascot one, the guy who was actually in this co- costume wanted to be in photo day. Like I dressed up as that as an intern. I've, anything I, I've, I've, I can admit this now, but one time I had to drive a, uh, a like they forgot their sticks at the arena and they're t- taken off to go flying. And a, a guy in our office, I won't say his name, but he said, take these drive as fast as your car goes. And if you get pulled over, have them call me. So, I mean, I was in this Mercury Mountaineer going deep into the triple digits flying down the highway with these like 50 or 60 sticks in the car. But like to me, you know, like these are the coolest things ever at the time. But like, you know, over the years, I've kind of crafted, uh, you know, a role into doing uh, mostly like the the website and like putting up all the information that that would kind of be like my base things. Like there's always things that need to be changed. Like when the sales people want to upgrade, update ticket prices, this, that, and the other, there's stuff that comes through. There's a ton of boring stuff to it, like filling or making form stacks. I'm sure you filled out a thousand of those in your, in your life, just like stupid, boring things like that. But during, uh, for a while I did a lot of like uh, smaller, like video projects where, you know, we, uh, with the community, like, you know, we go out and we help this, that, and the other group. There's so many of them. I can't just, you know, pick one, but we just put together a little video of it, put it on social media and, you know, go from there. But the, with a, with a hockey team, 
having something like, you know, Facebook, Twitter, that is really how you share everything. And like, that's how it's always in your face. So there, like, it's almost so like, there's nothing more important, more important than like being out there on, you know, on all these platforms that, you know, it's so easy because people want to see all this stuff. And I mean, for a while, it would just be me taking a camera down after a lot, you know, after we win a game, I'm sitting there right as they come off the ice and they're, you know, they're fist bumping the fans or whatever like that. Like people, you know, like you could put out stuff like this every single, you know, 20 minutes for a whole day and people are going to like it. People are going to, you know, want to watch it at least. It, you know, and that it goes both ways too, because, you know, the team was doing bad and, you know, everyone gets on there, you know, gets their trigger fingers out and starts being a keyboard warrior and telling you about this, that, and the other. And there's tough times where, you know, you don't really want to post anything or things are bad or whatever, but I mean, it's so necessary that it really, so like, I'm not even the main person who does this. We have another girl at our office who uh, she is like the tweeter. Like, I mean, like, well, I'll, I'll, I'll quote like, we have like a, a video highlight system that I can cut and clip uh, uh, footage for uh, like game highlights, you know, like someone scores, I clip this, put it out and I'll tweet it like right there because I can kind of speak as a hockey player to be like, you know, whatever the goal is, I'll give it that kind of like hockey touch to whatever. But this girl, I mean, she is connected, like absolutely connected to the point where I don't even like someone would come by and ask a question about some stat or something. I'd be like, Elise knows because I don't know. And I would have to like, look this up or whatever, but she is like the central nervous system of this, you know, of, uh, of the, of all of our social media accounts, you know, Twitter, Instagram, but she's always on there following everything that happens every day. And it's something that I, you know, I didn't, when I started, it was just me and it would like, I thought it was cool, whatever, enjoyed posting this, that, and the other, but like, it really is so intense when your brand is fun and online. Now you can have a company that it has to be online, but it's not necessarily just like a party every post, excuse me, <laughs> that, that you make, you know, like, yeah, yeah. it's, yeah. it doesn't really work like that. Yeah. So it, I, I mean, yeah, my company's social media team, we make educational software <laughs> and uh, <laughs> it, it, we're, they're online and they try to be fun, but it's a different kind of fun. Yeah. Than what you're talking about. It just doesn't really. There's usually lots of smiling children in the videos, you know, which is great. (laughs) Smiling children are fun. Yeah. And Um, you you need to have a presence. Yeah. But people and people form people form, um, you know, perceptions of of this stuff. And it's just, you know, to to people of a certain age, it's like, man, why did I work so hard in college? You know, like I, I, I had several scholarships to college and I worked real hard and I got a master's degree and I did all this stuff. And, you know, I do this, you know, I do this financial work and, and, you know, for my company. And then, you know, here's somebody over here getting paid just as much to tweet, you know, yeah. and it's like, it, and that's, I think you get a lot of, um, you, know, you get a lot of eye rolls and stuff, but I, I have no doubt that, um, you know, that, that it's, it's, you know, work is work is work. And, yeah. you know, it's, uh, it's just interesting to hear somebody, hear somebody talk, hear somebody talk about their job. Um, it especially is. if it's a job that you can't necessarily conceive of exactly. I mean, no one wants to hear about how I send bills to people most of the day, you know, but, but that pays, that pays just, you know, it's yeah, not like we're getting, it takes a while, but yeah, it does. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I have a house. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and it, I think that's just kind of what, how, you yeah. know, it is in 2021 where there are those jobs and like, uh, you know, most of my, in school, I wasn't really friends with kids in journalism school. It was all the sales guys and all the business school guys and all this, that, and the other. And those guys have great jobs and they, you know, get tons of vacation, do this, that, and the other. The last year I've pretty much been on vacation, but before yeah. that, I mean, I would get a week off in the summer and that was the one week that would be when you know, I could actually get off. But other times during that summer, it would be like, okay, this person's out for three weeks. Like at bottom of the tone pole, my first two years, I think I had five days off. And, it, you know, it's, it's yeah. seven, you know, not 7am, but 9am would be the first, on a game day, we, uh, I would come in. Um, and at 1030, we would run the, this like live pregame show through Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, all this stuff. And, then I would end the day with our, you know, post-game interviews at 11 p.m. at night. And between 
that time and that time, I'm sure 10 things happen that you have to jump on and do this. And it like, it is crazy. It is an absolutely very stressful, not stressful, but very demanding. Sure. No, I have no doubt that it is. Um, we talked, I talked about this a little bit with Jordan in the last episode, you know, Jordan yeah. is, you know, <laughs> a kid, he and his friend from their, from their, uh, from their little high school in the, in the suburbs, you know, yeah. making goofy podcasts and, and stuff. And then, you know, next, and then they, they did it enough at the right time to, yep. I'm, this is a spoiler for the plot of that, of that episode. And then, you know, MLB, MLB offers them a job. Mm-hmm. <laughs> just like that yeah you know? and that was the coolest thing it, uh, yeah. yeah and and so and so i i kind of made this point then that like it it takes a lot of guts it's a weird word to, it's it's a weird word to apply to it but it takes a lot of guts to pursue something that you're sincerely passionate about as a career yeah. um you know there's a lot of us that like you know i thought you know yeah i wanted to i wanted to play um I wanted to play awesome rock music on the radio and be a DJ, mm-hmm. or I wanted to be, you know, one of these things, you know, that, that's what I wanted to do for a living. But I think I also yeah. knew intellectually, that's a really hard, that's a really hard um, field to be in. And, yeah. and they're, you know, and they're, the radio AR is giving you the, uh, the newest Nicki Minaj single that you had to play 72 <laughs> times this week. And if you yeah. don't, Warner music group is going to come down here and, you know, slap you across the head because this isn't getting the place that it needs. And you, you realize that, you know, a lot of these things aren't, you know, what you yeah. play in music, you know, like I did that for a little bit too. I, uh, when I first got to college, they were like offering, like, you know, come in and work the radio. And I was like, Oh my God, like yeah. I get to play the songs, you know? And then it would be like, okay, you have to go in at four in the morning and, uh, here's the stuff. Oh, by the way, like, I remember, uh, Pearl Jam had just put out their CD in 2009. God, you know, it wasn't very good. Sorry. By normal. It was, it no. was whatever that album was in 2009. No, Lightning Bolt. Yes, I believe so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like, it was, it was there a week early. And this is before things leaked. And, you know, you had all this stuff. And I was like, oh, that's super cool, you know, or whatever. But then I got there and it was four in the morning and I was just like press and play. And they're like, this is what we're going to play today, whatever, you know. It doesn't really end up being what you think it is in your head because you're like, man, I just want right. to share my love of music with right. this radio station. And, it was and like, I think, you know, and I, I, of- well, I rationalized that and I was like, you know what? I don't need to do that. I don't need to do that for a living. Why don't I get yeah. a job that, you know, because I guess maybe part of me was like, you know, I don't really want to. I don't want to take the risk of losing my, you know, like, you know, what if, yeah. what if, uh, you know, what if I work for the, what if I work for an NHL team and it doesn't work out and then I hate hockey and I end up having to go in and sell insurance, you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, now I don't mean to put down selling insurance as that's what my brother does, but, um, but it's, it's a been, safe job. Yeah. And, you know, and like- I mean, there, the jobs all have their, their benefits. And I guess I, I was just, um, you know, some of us, I say some of us just because I'm sure there are people like me, I'm not trying to speak for everyone, but, um, I just, I never, I never felt comfortable taking that leap in that way. And so when somebody does that, like Jordan did and like you have done, um, you know, you're passionate about hockey. I know that the, you know, the blues may not have been, if you had sketched it on paper, I mean, you're, you know, you're a Chicago guy. I mean, would you have, I mean, I assume you grew up liking the Blackhawks, right? I mean, it's, yeah, it's funny that you say that because I always tell people that. that growing up, well, first of all, the Hawks were terrible, but to me, I always throughout my childhood, I never really like the Hawks like I do the Cubs or yeah. I would always just watch hockey to watch the best players. And there was a time in my kid, my childhood where I was a blues fan mm-hmm. and it was like, I would, you know, I would just be fans of whatever team was kind of, you know, until I got to be 14 or 15 and it was just like the Hawks and they, they weren't really good when I was in high school. It wasn't until college that they actually, you know, started winning, but it was always something that, I didn't, you know, truthfully, I didn't know what else to do. And that was why I didn't stop playing hockey in high school. And it was like, the old, like when I was starting at Mizzou, like it was the only thing I cared about. And it, to be honest, until the end of it, it was really the only thing I cared about. And I can't sit there. There were a few moments where I said, yeah, I'm going to like, I'm going to try and make this work, but I'm not going to, you know, go do something a little more logical or whatever. And I can't say that it, I was sure the whole time, but it was really more of a, well, I admit, like this has happened. Like, let's just see what happens. And like, sure. I, you know, I, I can't claim to have stared at the thing logically said, 
this is smart. This is, you know, kind of risky. It, this was the only path that I kind of saw because I was yeah. 21 or 22. And at that time, I guess I wouldn't have admitted to myself, like, hey, this is coming to an end if you don't like, you know, keep going in some way. Because I didn't want to even admit, imagine a world where I stopped playing hockey, you know, even right. if it was for, you know, club, club college or whatever. Yeah. Like it was just something that I wanted to do. And then it yeah, just I mean, I didn't want to, I didn't want to leave college and quit being on the radio. So I went to grad school and that turned <laughs> out to be uh, about a month into grad school, which I was in a one-year program and yeah. it was like an accelerated two years into one year, you know, MBA program. Mm -hmm. And like, I was like, I can't, I was like, I'm still going to be in my fraternity. I'm still going to do the radio. I'm still going to yeah. do all this stuff. I'm going to have all the fun. Guess what? I had to quit all of that crap <laughs> to get through graduate school. Yeah. And it was like, <laughs> Oh, that didn't work out. I get to still be here, but then I kind of had to quit everything, mm -hmm. and I, I got to do a radio show like two hours a week, and that was like all I had time to do because I was in the business building fourteen hours a day, every single yeah. day, um, they, uh, eating well, Burger King twice a day. <laughs> <laughs> it's because that was right. It was right down the block, and you know, and I was like, oh man, this yeah, it's hard this, to. Yeah. It's tough. So, you know, I mean, things, things have a way to, things have a way of working out and it always seems like grass is a little greener on the other side. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, in, in some, some form of me wishes, you know, I could, I could, I could work for a team, you know, I, as a kid, I was like, I'm not that good at baseball, but maybe I'd love to be the general manager of the Reds and I'd make some awesome trades, you know? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I will say that if someone would have told me that if, you, if you go to Yale, you can become an MLB GM when right. I was nine oh, years yeah, old. Totally. I would have tried a lot harder in school oh, because yeah. I didn't get that you had to actually do all that stuff. I just thought like, you know, whoever, Ryan Sandberg became the GM of the Cubs and that was like yeah. how it worked. But, you know, I saw that that all happened. But it's right. funny that you say all that stuff about like having to quit because my senior year of the journalism school at Mizzou, I'm not bragging about this when I say it, but it's the number one like broadcast journalism school in the country. Yeah. Allegedly. Really? Okay. I didn't but, know that. Yeah. I mean, I went to a school, I went to a school that was pretty well known for that as well, but I, I don't think anybody ever. Where did you go? One. Ohio university. Yeah. Yeah. Also very good. And it, it would, it would always between that and Northwestern. And it was like, okay. Northwestern was the more traditional number one, whereas we were doing like the new media type of deal, all this new stuff. Media. And okay. this is right when Twitter and all that stuff was just blossoming. And it was like, wow, wow, West at the time. But I had so many teachers like tell me you got to quit playing hockey. Like this isn't going to work. And there would be stuff on the weekend where I had to do. And there was a time where uh, I guess we can talk about these now because it's long gone and I do have the degree, even though I didn't really earn it. And uh, okay. Well, you, okay. You made it sound, I was going to ask if you would actually, you made it sound like you didn't finish the last few hours. Yeah. So, so I, I, well, let's tell that story really quick first. Okay. Go ahead. I, I was curious back. if you actually did finish it because yes. I have friends who who did the same kind of thing. They left and they were like four credit hours short or whatever. And <laughs> my just, parents would have killed me if I didn't right. finish school. Yeah, I, as a parent, point. I would kill my kid for doing that. Yeah. I mean, if you're going to quit, quit early. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I anyway, know go ahead. Kids who yeah. didn't, you know, finish. But so that uh, I finished the whole year interning and I had to go back to finish like one class, which was on the news. It was like, okay. you were, you know, I was a TV reporter. I'm uh -huh. sure if you Google my name and KOMU, which is the station, some of the clips are still up there. Yep. And it was horrible. It was, I was, I was just, I mean, are we talking like boom goes the dynamite kind of bad or no, 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 I wasn't bad. Well, I'm sure I was bad on there. I haven't watched many of them in a long time, but just for, I had just done a year in basically paradise in my life. Like it was like, this is hockey. I, again, I would have cleaned the floors for a year. I didn't care. Like it was so cool to be there for all this stuff and to be there. And then I came back and these people just treat you like another kid coming through the school. And like, I mean, I was having like panic attacks. I, I, would, I was on the news. So I would drive. I would have had to be on the air at 6 a.m. on Wednesday morning. So I would work. Monday, Tuesday, this is like in the summer. I hadn't been hired yet, but I was like, you know, they were like, hey, we're going to try and open a position. You know, it was in the works, mm -hmm. but I didn't know anything. I was still interning. So I would intern there Monday and Tuesday, and then I would drive. I would leave St. Louis at two in the morning to, uh, to go all the way down. I would get, uh, you know, Red Bulls and all this stuff, and I would drive down. I'd start Wednesday morning. I, I think I would do... 
I can't remember how the whole schedule worked out, but it ended with a, the 5 PM Friday, which is the worst slot in news because everyone's gone. No one wants to talk to you, all this stuff, whatever. Okay. But, I, and I was staying at the old house I used to live at. None of the kids I actually went to school with, it was one of my friend's brother. And I mean, I developed an eye twitch. Like I was just, it was horrible. Like I was just like dealing with it. I couldn't, I couldn't like process anything. It was all this stuff that I didn't really want to even do in the first place. It's hard for me to get motivated about things like that. And I did like what I thought was the minimum requirement for all the things. Uh, My last day was July 4th. And then like, I went back to St. Louis and honestly just like forgot about school. I was like, I don't send me the diploma or whatever. I don't know what's going on. Right. So I get an email from this, from the head of a head of the broadcast department, whatever, Stacy Waffle, very chill guy. And he sends me this thing about like, I need to do this much in the other, this isn't really up to standard, you know, like, and this is in like August or something. And I sent him an email back and I was like, Hey, uh, like I, I'm going to work for this. Like, I don't know what you want from me, but I'm not really going to do anything else <laughs> in, like sense, in that sense of an email. And he just kind of sent me this thing back where, he, you know, I'm sure this has happened a lot of times with him because, you know, a, a lot of people go through the journalism school and don't become journalists. Right. Right. Whatever. And he's just like, all right, like send me a three page paper about what you've learned in the journalism school and how it will relate to your career or something. And we'll call it a day. And I was like, wow, okay. like that, that actually worked, you know, like yeah. couldn't believe it. And he was so cool about it. But I mean, there were plenty of teachers who, I had to retake a class because we were playing in the, uh, our league finals or the playoffs were like a weekend long thing. I was like, I'm going to play in this. And they're like, well, I'm going to fail you. And you have to take this again uh, next semester. And I was like, thank you. And I'm still going, you know, <laughs> like it just didn't really, it, it was, there was just a lot of people like that who were convinced yeah. that if I didn't, you know, and that's, I'm glad that it happened when I was 18, 19, 20, because I really had no clue about what was going on in the world or how I should be acting. And I was just doing it, but it it was tough because there's a lot of people who think that, you know, if you don't end up as a sports anchor for some town in Iowa, like you didn't make it or something, you know, and quad cities, baby. (laughs) Hell yeah. Um, uh, There's a story, the most, the most uh, famous recent, um, uh, journalism slash broadcast grad of OU is Matt Lauer, who obviously Matt Lauer mm-hmm. has, there are some things have happened with Matt Lauer yeah. in the last few years, but <laughs> this, what I'm talking about was 20 years ago and he was the guy on the today show and he was well-known and very famous. Yeah. And, I mean, he's still famous, but now kind of not as much for the right reasons. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, it had come out, he, they got him to come back to OU to do, you know, like a thing, speak at graduation or whatever. And that's when they, they published the story that he had never gotten his degree because he left, he left school um, and didn't get his last few credit hours because he'd gotten an internship on the Today Show. So they made a big ceremony about like giving him his real diploma, not a, not an honorary diploma, but a real yeah. diploma that's, that gave him credit for that time, like practicum credit or whatever they call it. Mm-hmm. Um, because, you know, it was important that he be an actual graduate of the school, but he'd actually left early and didn't get it and was like, I'm out of here, man. Yeah. You know, and then he was, of course, a millionaire many times over by that point. And um I don't know if that's still the case, but um, <laughs> I, I, nobody's heard anything from him in a, him in a while. So, yeah. but uh, I, w- th- I always thought that was really funny. We, they, they have a joke that pretty much everybody famous who went to our school never actually got a degree and they all left, or, you know, uh, the name, and I'm not going to go through all the names, but. You our, know. Mo- our most famous uh, never graduated was Brad Pitt. Oh, okay. Yeah. Cause he was hours short in the J school, apparently. Oh, I, yeah. And then one day there was a rumor one day that he was back on campus I, it would it would have been like, you know, I don't want to I don't. But every girl was looking around to see if this is the truth. I'll never forget this day for the rest of my life. It was like mm-hmm. this is right at the beginning of Twitter, so you could have put out like, I just saw Brad Pitt at the camp, you know, plaza, or whatever, and everyone would yeah, go right. There. He's gonna walk up. Hey, I'm Brad Pitt. <laughs> yeah. Just here to finish up my degree. Yeah, it was just. So I don't know what kind of impression that is, but yeah, it was like a Western bat bread. Pit, I yeah. Don't really I, I don't know. I did just see the, the, um, the latest Tarantino movie with where he, um, which, uh, once upon a time in Hollywood. Yeah. I liked um, it. Yeah. And I'm not a big plays, movie guy, but I'll see any Tarantino movie. And I was actually was... thinking of his character from there where he kind <laughs> of is like too cool for, but he's really the stunt guy who kind of gets treated like crap. Yeah. yeah and it, it was, yeah, I liked that one a lot. Um, it was good. 
I mean, Tarantino movies have too much gratuitous violence for me. Um, yeah. Like I get he's he's living out revenge fantasies on the Manson family or he's living out revenge fantasies on the Nazis or whatever. And that's all great. But it's kind of hard for me to watch. So, yeah, uh, I can't I grew up Unitarian. I can't deal with all this violence and war. So it's it's tough for me anyway. Um, <laughs> all right. Well, uh, John, I we I think, we, you know, the the. I keep worrying Zoom's going to cut me off because I set the meeting for two hours and we've already. <laughs> Is it really? Yeah. Oh, we still got um, 20 minutes. Let's... Yeah. Okay. Well, I you mean, know, we can hit whatever else you want to talk about fast fire. We don't have to. Yeah, no, I know. I, yeah. I mean, Yelich. these, Hey, these are unscripted. We got to Christian Yelich. That was really good. We covered your job, which is great. I mean, I, well, yeah, actually, you... let me just finish one quick thing about, okay, good. No, please do. Whole... But yeah. the blues thing, was, I'm not going like... to edit any of this out. Yes, but just to kind of like round that whole thing off was winning the Stanley Cup two years ago or whatever that was. Yeah, like, okay. It was, it like, I don't want to sound like grandiose when I say this, but like it changed everything. Like everything about how I saw things, how like, because it was always like a joke. Because the Blues are a good team. They always, they're kind of like a, you know, like the Atlanta Braves, not in the greatest things of the 90s, where they're always a very competitive hockey team. But to win a Stanley Cup is almost it's it's luck, you know. Hockey is the most random game proven by stats, and it's just it just seems so impossible at times, you know. Where like that was always the dream, and you know, it was all it was a laughing matter to oh yeah, one day you're gonna end up getting a ring, and like this is like a part of why you work here and all this stuff. Mm-hmm. And it, sure. it uh, you know, I don't know if you know or anyone else who's watching this, but like the Blues in, in that season were in last place in January, last place in the league. Everything was falling apart. Every, you know, we would just sit there after games like, man, you know, this just isn't good. And then like, just to be to watch the momentum happen. Like I every, you know, if you're connect, that connected to a team, like everyone watches teams. I watch every day, every single game the Cubs play every year, whatever. But to be kind of in that like that time was just such like a eye-opening thing and just to watch the whole thing happen and then I mean the playoffs were so stressful (laughs) I I mean it was unlike anything ever like to ever be a part of and like to get through that all and kind of just you know it all happened we did this big parade you know it'd been fit they never won a cup but they've been a team for 50 years they've lost four Stanley Cups and just to be a part of it totally changed like my life and just how I see other people, how it's, it's still, I mean, it's been two years, but it's still like kind of really hard to put concretely into like, it's almost like you finish the journey. I'm 20, I was 27 or something when it happened, Mm -hmm. but really like, I mean, you could have taken me off, you know, you can take me away anytime you want now. And there's really nothing I've ever wanted after that you know like wow. it, 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 again it's, 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 it's a really pretty crazy. big statement it, it really big. is yeah. and i mean you gave me the cubs world series in 2016 i saw that yeah. as a fan yeah i was at i mentioned this briefly but i was at the game that, yeah i was i was actually going to specifically bring this up because i wanted to give you a chance to to uh talk about that because and it felt i was so i was at yeah. the game uh, game six of the nlcs uh, against the dodgers where they won five nothing mm-hmm. and that as a fan like being there and it, it was almost as a perfect game in terms of being an anti Cubs game where they never had a runner in that game reach second base. And like the Cubs where they made an out were in a lead, they would never relinquish. Mm-hmm. They, you know, they blasted Kershaw five, nothing. It's and it not was, a nail biter in other words. Yeah. And like what game <laughs> I was at the Steve Bartman game as well in 2003. Oh yeah. And yeah. Everybody knows about that. I know. And like, so, I mean, I stared at that corner, you know, in the eighth inning of that game, I, you know, like I, you know, you expect something. I, I mean, was at the, don't really you know, blame Steve Bartman, right? I mean, no, 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 okay. No, no. I didn't think so. so. It doesn't seem reasonable to blame Steve. Let Bartman. me, uh, let me take a quick detour. I'm playing okay. a hockey at club hockey and this kid, I'm like a senior. This kid's a freshman or he's a sophomore, whatever. Quiet kid, whatever. Doesn't know, apparently, I'm this huge Cubs fan. And he just drops one day that Steve Bartman was his little league coach. He was on that team. He's wearing a little league, a crew neck of a, so- or a baseball team. One of my friends was like on that team. And he like was a coach. And I was just like, 
I was like, Pff. I was like, dude, dude tell me all about this. Yeah, Bartman has been very famously reclusive. Like yeah, no, one can, no one can get him to talk to the media. No one didn't they didn't they make a documentary like an ESPN yes. thirty for thirty Catch or something where they, it was like searching for Bartman, right? Yeah. I mean they found yeah. him, but he's he and, but talk, this is the yeah. this is the whole thing. And then I would say I, I believe they talked about this in the documentary in a way, but yeah. It was, you know, like Cubs fans and all the things known as being, you know, lovable losers, blah blah blah. Come here, you know, have a good time, whatever. But there are times when things get serious and that was a very that was a time where things were very serious you know and i mean i was in the ballpark and i could tell you how angry everyone was but it, it and it yeah, just happened guy. to be that guy yeah but yeah it all been. you could feel it slipping away you really could and now despite carrie wood's home running game seven being before the, winning that pennant in 2016 the best moment at wrigley field hands down I still watch that video like once every month or so just to get some goosebumps because it really was such a cool moment. Mm -hmm. But I told, I could have told you at 12 years old that that was slipping away and you could feel mm -hmm. just that, you know, when are you going to get back? When are you going to do this? And I, you know, maybe in, in 2021, that doesn't really happen the same way that you criticize him because yeah, there's social media, but there would also been plenty of voices that says, guys, let's stop. Like, we lost the game. Gonzalez made the error. We can't right. close out. There was game. a lot of stuff that got screwed yeah. up. Yeah. You know, that gets mentioned. But at the time, the, the you know, the TV radio guys are all like, look at this guy, you know, and doing this. And, you know, what did he do? What did he, you know, you got to know this, that, and the other. And yeah. I think that it was all, I mean, I was, can we swear on this podcast? Yes, no. I mean, you know, make I'll it bleep it out. What? Well, I, there were 45,000 people in that building screaming bleep hole at this guy. And I mean, my dad, m you know, me, I'm not saying I'm blamed because every single person was not, it wasn't just like a oh, oh, chant. I mean, screaming at this guy and you know, am I proud of it? No. But at the same time, you also can't really comment on it if you're not a Cubs fan and had seen them lose. And like, you're, you're sitting there five outs away from it actually happening where when Theo did it, it felt like it was, you know, not a, an eventuality or, because, but you knew that they were building a good program. Yeah. And, that, and, they, and that even if the, maybe they didn't win it this year, they'd be yeah, back. They would reload and they'd come back. But it, it, the Cubs of 2003, it was like, or in the, I mean, that was the first playoff series they'd won since the 1940s. Like, right. they didn't win any in the 80s or anything. I know, like that. I know they had the division title when I was a fairly young kid in 84. But they didn't win any playoff series. So they didn't win any series, right. They, they hadn't even won a playoff game at Wrigley in years. And, right. like, I th it's just very hard to be critical. You know, obviously, it's my own kind, and I was part of it. But, <laughs> <laughs> you know. Also, why are you wearing a, why are you wearing a Walkman in the middle of a, of a game I yeah that, that too do people yes. really do that i i, I guess again, there's a lot of it was just a weird group of people and it, you know like it okay. became kind I, of cool i'm not trying things. to make fun of the guy i've just it's a very interesting detail it was like, an easy guy to make not fun wearing of. that walkman maybe that doesn't happen if there was a if there was a guy with a skull tattoo on his neck i bet you they don't talk about him you know but it was a guy who looks a little dorky and it's an easy he, target. He yeah, he, he, he probably is. Yeah, he's probably on the spectrum. Yeah. You know, just, he's probably he's just, he's kind of an easy target. Yeah. yeah. And that's, I mean, I know a few things about being an easy target. I got a baby face. People love to say things to me all the time, but I understand <laughs> it. And, and, but at the time, it was no one else had anything else because you're, you'd never been that close. You were never, no Cub fan, whether you were 90 years old or yeah. 12 years old had been close and you were told that it's never, you're never going to be close. And all of a sudden you're, you know, you're playing them. It's not like you're playing the, you know, the St. Louis Cardinals or, you know, obviously it wouldn't work, but it's the New York Yankees of the nineties, right? You're playing the Marlins. Like we're in, like this is happening. You know, at yeah. the same time, the Red Sox think they're in. You think, you know, we're six outs away, five outs away from a Cubs Red Sox world series when both teams had never, you know, gotten that far, but, I mean, that 2016 World Series was, as I mean, as good as it can get in terms of just being a fan and the ups and downs. Even when Rajay Davis hit that home run off Chapman, I didn't like 
go mad. I was, I remember I had, uh, I don't have uh, on me right now, but I have seats from Wrigley Field, like, uh, you know, whatever. And I said that I would sit in this, the seats for this game. And I had a Zoom call like right now, but all my friends from school were basically watching me watch the game. And in 2016, I mean, you mean? Yes, for yes, for the, you know, game seven, I said I would do it, even though I, I felt so uncomfortable. And as did soon as the game ended, I hung up yeah. on all of them and went and did my thing. But you know, when that happened, it was more of just like, is this the greatest baseball game I've ever watched? After Davis hit the home run, it wasn't like, oh, my life's over. This is this, that, and the other. Like, it was just such a. It. I don't think it can't get any better. As a, as a baseball fan than that. And it kind of felt like how I felt like after the blues won it all where now I watch baseball and I'm just happy to be here. And like every day, like I got this, you know, the angels game on right here, Josh Fleming, shout out to uh, Columbia high school where a lot of my friends are from pitching for the race. I know Tani took him deep tonight, but like, I just love it now in a way that I didn't love it before 2016 and before 2019 for hockey, where, I don't really care what happens. We win. I'm happy. We lose. I don't really care, but it doesn't have any effect on me or, you know, whatever. And I'm not li living and dying off of every single second of. Every yeah. Second. It's yeah. It gives, it gave me such great inner peace as weird as that. And again, I'm sorry for all the people who've actually probably found inner peace and I'm, you know, shitting on their, Oh, crapping on their, <laughs> uh, you know, their years of meditation <laughs> or whatever. But, uh, it's, it's just, fine. it's such like a nice feeling where the only thing I have left is the stupid Vikings in the NFL. Yeah. And I, it, 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 it's so much worse now because I and don't. And your fantasy league. Yes. Well, <laughs> if we win that, I think it's going to take a bigger miracle. You, than the I care, I, you'll probably just quit, right? You'll win and be like. No. Yeah. Or I might just release and then I'll just play all my favorite players regardless of how well they're doing. Right. Rizzo can play until he's 45. You can't start Ed Howard. He's in double A. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. In <the> roster. <laughs> yeah. That's probably what I'll do because once the Vikings win, God, if they, they just need to make it to one Super Bowl, then I'll be free of it all. But now all that energy has been focused in there and I can barely even watch the games without like digging my fingernails and because it's all that's left. And maybe it's, you know, it's, some of you needs to feel that way, but I don't know. It's just like a weird, a weird thing. Whereas before, I mean, I would be that guy, you know, sitting on the edge of my couch watching games like this, like, yeah. come on, you can do it. You know, like, whereas now, is, you know, the Cubs could be up in the bottom of the ninth, whatever. And, you know, just I'm like, oh, you know, we did it. Or, you know, <laughs> way to go. Yeah, I love you. But, like, if they lose, it's – I need to adopt more of your attitude towards these. I mean, I don't necessarily get all worked up, but I yeah. I get very, very fatalistic and very, like, you know, oh, yeah. what what's going to go wrong now? It's like it's a – it's a, it's a Midwestern sports fan thing. Like, yeah. you know, things, oh, oh, they're winning now, but wait till they screw it up, you know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. And, you know, I'm, I'm a fan of a pretty, you know, an NFL team known for its futility, you know, and, and yeah. uh, in the Bengals. And, Bengals. and uh, I've, I, I honestly, I hold, I always talk about how I hold the Bengals out at arm's length. Uh, I don't, I don't go to their games. I don't buy merchandise. I don't, yeah. I'll watch a game if it's on, you know, like Joe Burrow gets hit last year, you know, in, in, tears ACL and I'm like yep and I click turn the game off just like that yeah. walked away didn't watch another game the rest of the season and uh you know just waiting for it to happen because it, it it was all lined up they draft the premium quarterback who's yeah. the hometown guy you know and um and then they don't put a line in front of him and it's like what did you think was going to happen mm -hmm. yep just a matter of time he made it 10 games you know and that that kind of stuff that was the that's the thing that stands out so and so that's why, you know, because I'm, because Cincinnati is a baseball town, just like St. Louis is a baseball town. Mm -hmm. um, and I know you're not a Cardinals fan. I know we talked about how, you know, you do appreciate the Cardinals fandom, even though you're a Cubs fan, you just have to kind yeah. of keep it because Cubs and Cardinals is a pretty rough rivalry. I won't um, wear any being in a Cubs baseball town building. Foot, football's the sideshow, you know, and now living in the city here in Columbus, where I live now, where college football is, you know, yeah. Uber Alice and the hockey team and the, and the soccer team are, you know, they're fine. They're fun, but they're, they're sideshows while we wait for the football season yeah. to come around. Yeah. And, you know, I don't, I, it's. I, I've lost it. I totally had that same mentality before. I remember a uh, perfect example for just the Vikings was uh, Teddy Bridgewater. I mean, uh, yeah. what a lovely guy. 
I, you know, at Teddy, least there's but, no video of, of what happened to Teddy Bridgewater. Right. I've, I've heard that it was a non-contact thing in practice. And, yeah. But well, I, mean, I mean, if there was video, happened. you'd have to see it. You know what I mean? Yeah. And no, thanks. It, honestly, it broke my heart, yeah. like, because he wasn't there. And then I, that year, I remember one of my good friends is a Tampa Bay Bucks fan was a Tampa Bay Bucks long before they got Brady, all, you know, all this stuff. Yeah. And he's just this quiet kid. And, and real he was bad like, for a real long time. Yeah. And like he came over, it was me and him watching the Super Bowl this year during this whole thing. And uh, I was so happy for him. But at the time, like he asked me to come to like, a, or he's like the Bucks were playing the, the Vikes in like week five of that year. And like, he's like, Hey man, yeah, you want me to come over? Like we'll watch the game. And I was just like, I don't want to, I don't want to watch come over, watch the stupid team play with Case Keenum. Like I'm <laughs> tired of this. Like, Get me out of this life of NFL. I just, I'm, I can't deal with it, dude. Teddy's gone. He's never coming back. And then what happens? Like Case Keenum leads him on this journey to, you know, to one game away from the Super Bowl. Now that, you know, they end up really killing the whole thing, losing to the Eagles by 30 something points in the NFC championship game. But that game, you know, the Minneapolis miracle was just kind of like one of those moments where it was like, yeah, you know, it's like that it was, doesn't matter, man. That you was something. Gotta, I remember that. Yeah. I mean, and I, and I, at that point, I'd become one of those people who had just been just so like this bad, this bad. Don't show any emotion, whatever. F this. I'm done with this all. And we were at a bar, and I mean, I ran out in the snow and like face dove into like a pile. Like I was like a ten year old again, and. <laughs> the problem was, is I let my guard down and if they scored, they went up seven, nothing against the Eagles. And then I really let my guard down. And I was like, yay, like we're going to do it. And then they get smacked. And then, but it, it, you know, it took a, you know, a month or two or whatever. And I realized about like how you just have to be a supporter of the team. And like people talk about Kirk cousins, this, that, and the other. I mean, he is the biggest talk about an easy target the easiest target in the world. Me and Kirk Cousins are the most opposite people of all time. Like, you know, he he is he is what he is, right? But I don't care about anything. I will support that guy every single game he ever plays quarterback. If he wins, he loses. Same with all 53 other guys on the team. That's just that's what I think it really is at the end of the day is that no matter if you know what's going to happen at the end of the thing, you just got to be behind your guys and people, you know, like I can't really ever say anything bad about anyone who plays on any of my teams anymore. People like, especially here in St. Louis, because, you know, uh, the Cubs took him, but Jason Hayward, people all the time want me to say bad things about Jason Hayward as a hitter. And I was like, you know, man, I just, first of all, his defense. I mean, God, you know, like, it's I have so to valuable. admit, I have to admit he comes up to bat and the Cubs have two runners on and I'm like, <laughs> okay, it's just Hayward. You know, yeah. I mean, I hate to beat it, but is that you know, true? When yes. when Ian Happ comes up, Ian Happ, they'll all, you know, you would watch the yeah. broadcast. Oh, Ian Happ's from Cincinnati, you know. And if you're from Cincinnati, you're obviously a good person to people. Yeah, yeah, yeah you're saying. And then that. Ian Happ hits hits nine home runs in the series, and you know every, <laughs> and then he's not that good other than that. But he's scarred for um, life, you know. Or Kyle, they would do that with Kyle Schwarber too, who's also from Cincinnati. Yep. Um, yep. But uh, you know, when Hayward comes up, it's like an audible sigh of sigh of relief because he just seems to kind of can't. Can't yeah, can't hit, hit anymore. Hundred percent true. But you know what? He's You'll never hear me say star. that anywhere else besides right here. Because yeah, I'm just being honest. I'm yeah, hundred percent. But you know, like I'd say that about you know, for example, I, Castellanos. What a ball player. Biggest regret we have my entire life is letting that guy go. When the, he played that one summer for the Cubs, yeah, I felt like I was he wasn't born really again. that good before that though. He wasn't that good as a Tiger, really. Yeah, I mean, but got if you good remember, he bitch. Well, he complained about the the fences at the Comerica being way too deep. He can't hit his his they power were. zone is that left center field. It's four hundred billion miles away out yeah. there. And I'd read all this stuff. I did not expect that, and that's probably why it was so exciting at the time because you didn't really know what you were getting, but all of a sudden you were getting someone who was a ball player. And that you know his he hit the home runs and did all this stuff, but what he brought was the energy and I felt like that had kind of died during that time as a lot of the Cubs had gotten complacent whatever but he was he already guy. got suspended for taunting the Cardinals this year yeah so. I love I mean I just the guy was that was lame by the way yes I agree. and now Amir Garrett same thing suspended for taunting the Cubs which I mean you know, that is... was a little aggressive why did he, I don't know why he was talking to Rizzo like that 
It just seems so That's unnecessary. Amir Garrett, like I've listened to, well, Amir Garrett's been yeah. interviewed many times. He's been interviewed by Jordan and Jake. Um, you know, yeah, it's he's just, wild. It just seems like that's his thing. Guy. Well, he's a he's a he's a former basketball player, and he just yeah. you know yeah. there he aren't just, too many other talking. MLB relievers who you can go and find the sizzle reel from high school where they're dunking all over everybody all the time. Yeah, um, he's just and he just different. he's like he's is. like this is what I do. I'm I'm an emotional guy and whatever, and it's no disrespect and yeah. and yeah, and then uh, but it just seven games is that. Uh, you know, he didn't even yeah. touch someone like this yeah. is not i'm sorry man this is not yeah, yeah. Not uh, seven especially as i get that if you're a starter one start you know i understand when they do that but missing seven games from a guy in your pen regardless of what his era is this year i mean it was this number. it was the same suspension last year he tried to fight all of the pittsburgh pirates yeah yeah again which but- that's god's work i mean <laughs> People need to fight the Pittsburgh Pirates more often. I, I, I don't remember the exact details as well as I remember what just happened. But again, it just felt like that yeah. whole thing was so unnecessary. And well, like, he, he really fought uh, Trevor, you know, what's his name? Trevor Williams, who's on the Cubs now, right? Yeah. Yeah, who yeah. kind of got his butt handed to him the last time. Okay, but yeah. Um, it was just, I don't know. I love it. I mean, like, do whatever you got to do, man. 100%. <sighs> but – I mean, I feel like that whole thing with the Cubs and Reds started when Chapman threw it. Nate Shearholtz, uh, they probably showed that on the broadcast the next. Oh, day. when Chapman was on the Reds. Oh, so yes, when ago. Chapman was on the Reds and Rizzo went out to first base that next inning and then went to the dugout with the Reds. And I felt like that's never went away. There's always been something going on between sure. Rizzo, the Reds, and yeah, probably. It, you know, it's it, it's not something that you know has anything to do with Garrett. I mean, they did they did there was that thing between Baez and Garrett a few years back, something small, whatever. Right. But it's almost like you get reminded of it by other teammates and that story gets passed down, you know? Well, and like, yeah. And this last time Baez's quote was this guy's basically out of control and even his own teammates think it's out of control, Yeah, which is funny because I don't, I've never seen anything like that. I don't know where that comes from. He, Baez you know, is he, he, Honestly, that's Baez is not the kind of guy you really want to piss off because it seems like he's the kind of guy that's going to hit more home runs off of you when you make him yeah, mad. Yeah, 100%. He's an emotion player, too. And, you but know. But so uh, Garrett went after Baez at some point in the past, and Rizzo backed him up. Yeah. I don't, I don't remember that scenario. I can't speak on it for whatever. So when Baez came out, because he probably, you know, had something. And, you know, these guys – you know, we don't hear about who's a good teammate. Everyone's a great teammate, according to the writers, right? Because they all say this. No one's going to be like, yeah, this guy's terrible, dude. Like, he's such a jerk or whatever. Yeah. But I would assume, and I'm assuming, that these guys are all, ta- you know, like, I, you know, I'm sure he's maybe friends with someone on the Reds or something like that. And he hears something like that, you know, or they're talking. And, and yeah. Do I care if you want to yell at people when you get off the mound? But I thought for it was it wasn't like it was uh you know Cubs are down to uh, there's bases loaded two outs and he strikes the guy out. It was like the like a the Cubs yeah, are winning and Garrett has also pitched pretty poorly this season so far. Yeah, and, yeah. you know that not that might have led to that him. doesn't help if 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 Garrett's if Garrett hasn't given up a run yet and through his first 15 appearances yeah he's well, frustrated every, about what's going on but it was like but, a random the Cubs were up by a few runs I believe at the time or down by a few runs he hasn't thrown a non-hanging slider in the year 2021 <laughs> yet um he's <laughs> his ERA is still at like 10 yeah and I'm sure that probably that's should have acted like he'd been in the end zone before at that point he it was a random strikeout with nobody on base I was watching it on my screen right here while yeah. I was playing Xbox and I kind of just saw that. I'm like, that was weird. Like, that's gonna piss people off. Yeah. Yeah. He didn't just it, it just yeah. As, again, Rizzo's just like Joey Votto. It's not like, you know, it, it's not like they had been fighting the day before, and or so, it just felt very unnecessary on my part. I'm, but again, yeah, I'm kind of with you. Man. He still didn't deserve seven games for that. Though. Yeah, 100 percent agree. 100 percent agree on that fact. So, but that's they'll I'm, they'll man. reduce it to four or whatever and call it's, it good. Yeah. It should be three games, two, you know, two games. Or you know, don't even suspend the guy. Just let him. Yeah, unless punches know. are thrown, just let him play. God, it's just <laughs> silly. Hockey rules. Yeah, right. All right, man. Uh, probably should wrap this up. We uh, we hit the two hour mark. Um, it uh, it went by real fast. Um, no kidding. I didn't even ask. I'm not even going to ask you if you don't like any of the league rules because, um, you know. 
I don't like the rule where I don't get the first pick. The whole well, last we were doing the math about cows doing spreadsheets and stuff. Journalism guy, you know, last time I took a math class, I was like 17 years old. I yeah, can't, I don't. I just you know, <laughs> that's my complaint. I want when I have a terrible season, I want to pick want, number one. You want one. the first pick? Well, <laughs> right, and so no, but I like it. I do like that. Yes, it's, for it's for cool. for the rest of the world, we do a dorkiness on top of dorkiness. We do an NBA style lottery. Uh, where Kyle, who is a computer science teacher, yeah, as by profession, using has, big words on yes. me like that. Um, I I'm gonna have him. I'm gonna have him on here. Don't worry. He he doesn't want to do it right now because it's the end of the school year. But he's he's gonna be on later. Um, but uh, and he offered to do this, and it's like <laughs> we're already down the nerd hole, man. What are you what are you gonna <laughs> you do? do you know, let's just keep rolling. Maybe we'll come out the other end, right? So, yeah. you know, ner- the nerds control the world now, right? So, um. <laughs> so Kyle did it. And then those were also the very first videos that our league ever did. You know, it was like, oh man, someone in our league yeah. did a video and he's yeah. like, it, this is the person, yeah. you know, that, and that, that's actually, that might actually be um, where I got the idea to do this. What we're doing now uh, is, you know, that, and I just, um, you know, I always kind of wanted an excuse to do a podcast. So well, I think uh, it's good just because I, I think everyone's, you know, a, different way different person in this group despite we all like nerdy baseball stuff and you know we all get it but i'm a in a nerd a way different way than (laughs) kyle is right yeah right so like it's cool for him to you know like i obviously don't like care about whether you know how we get a draft but like for him to like do that is like you know that's that's showing who he is or whatever and you know I'm, i'm sorry you didn't get the first pick I mean, <laughs> you really wanted Spencer Torkelson that badly. Is that I it? probably would have taken Ed Howard. You would have taken Ed Howard. So who cares? <laughs> right. Exactly. I agree. I mean, I did get the number one pick. The year Otani came out. God bless. I remember that. Soul. Yeah, I think if I remember correctly, you picked in all caps. Yes. Yeah. It was, and then Otani he, proceeded to be good for a short period of time and then disappear. He's yeah. back now. He's back. And it's show hate time. It, just yeah. like just like you before him. I uh yeah. I do have two, uh, I have two large, probably my two big, I collect uh, baseball cards, football cards, stuff like that. But probably my two biggest collections are you Darvish and Shohei Otani, just because, you know, obviously great players and all that stuff. But mm-hmm. I think that players from Japan, you know, not that there aren't Americans that do this too, but have a much more uh, holistic approach. They just treat the game with such respect. Yeah. And that sounds like a weird way of like some like old white dude being like, he needs to play with more respect to the game. But, you know, like yeah. I remember, I can't remember exactly what it was, but there was this picture of a, uh, of like a chart somehow that Otani made that was like 40, he was a kid. And it was like, these are the 40 things I need to do that all set it like at the beginning it was like, it was like be a better pitcher or be a better baseball player. And it'd be like, things about hitting, things about pitching. And it was like, just the craziest thing. I'd never seen anything like that. Like that. And I, I don't, I can't really explain it, you know, in the same way that Ichiro did it too. And it's. Yeah, Ichiro was famous for that kind of stuff. I mean, he just, was just like I, crazy um, dedication to. Yeah. And, you know, obviously there's, I'm sure all these guys are just slaving away to be the best baseball player he was, but for him to make it look so easy, man, it's just, yeah. I mean, um, when, when, the, when the Reds signed Shogo Akiyama uh, last mm-hmm. offseason, Shogo Akiyama is not a hu- was not a huge star in Japanese baseball, but he was a yeah. consistently good player who like never missed a game. And it's, mm-hmm. it's really sad that he's, he's actually not played this season because he busted up his hamstring, but he's going to be back really soon. And mm-hmm. the, the, pre- the press, the Reds press um, went crazy because it was a new angle. You know, you're talking about, oh, look, the media is all fo- – the Japanese media are all following him around. And, you know, what's this guy like? And what's the – you know, um, and apparently he has a samurai sword in his locker and he does tricks with it. And it's yeah. apparently really awesome. And all these really great things that they just hadn't had uh, been able to put in the, in the newspaper before. And uh, yeah. so, yeah, there seems like there's a, um, the guys that make it over and, you know, a lot of these, a lot of the Japanese players, I mean, um, you know, they have a tendency, I mean, obviously some of them have done very well for themselves. I mm-hmm. mean, usually the star players are pretty good. But not everyone who's come over has been, you know, has been a smash hit. And uh, you, yeah, I love Pukadome swing though. Yeah, he just Fukudome. didn't know how to lay off any changeup or any off-speed pitch in the dirt, but still had a beautiful swing. It looked really nice. 
Yeah, you know? I mean, it looks like uh, I the other the other guy I was thinking of um, the uh, the Korean shortstop. I think um, you know who signed with the Padres. It sounds like he's having a pretty rough time adjusting. Yeah, um, uh-huh. and you know. Akiyama himself was pretty, pretty terrible for most of last year. And then suddenly the light went on and he had like a 500 on base percentage mm-hmm. for the last few weeks of the season. And, you know, and it's like, you know, and he's like, I don't, he, you know, he'll, he'll tell the, he'd tell the press, like, I don't know. I don't know why I'm not getting any hits. Like I've never done this bad ever. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it's like, you know, I mean, the yeah. American players have a tendency to repeat the same cliches. Just go yeah. 110% and, uh, yeah. oh, yeah, it's just a real one. I got that home run, man. And, you know, is it just got to go out there and play another game and, you know, yeah. keep making plays and, you know, score some more runs than the other team. We're going to win this thing. And, and uh, it, I don't know, it's just they have a different perspective entirely. Um, so, I, so I'm with you. That's really neat. Um, and I was happy for you. You got, uh, you got Otani. Um, and that explains why you seem so excited uh, when that happened. <laughs> he, I was, I was like, it was the same way. I mean, that was still, you know, that was post Bryce Harper YouTube explosion, but yeah. I was telling every single person I knew about this guy. I'm like, you don't even understand. Like he yeah. throws a hundred and he hits, I mean, exactly what is now on MLB, you know, the front page of MLB Otani. One game, 110 mile an hour exit below, 101, you know, fastball. It, and I was like, yeah. I was blown away by it. I was just like, this is the craziest thing I've ever heard of. Like, let's get this guy here right now, you know. And and everyone's like, you know, at the time, no one really understood. But I'm just glad that it's happening because for a while I was very concerned as he, yeah, as I'm watching it right now. But Lo- uh, logically, the Angels should probably have him pick one or the other. Um, no in terms of longevity Stop but it. also i realize even though that might be best for him it's probably not best for us yeah as fans I think, but i think he's good enough i think he's good enough 110 percent to do both baseball's hard i mean i i wouldn't be surprised if in a couple of years he he decides to be one or the other full-time i don't know which one it should be but yeah, um don't put these thoughts in my head i'm just, I'm just saying it makes me sick uh, yeah I, all right. Well, I don't want to. I don't want to end the call on this note. But <laughs> best of luck my this dreams. week. Best of best of luck. Best of luck this week uh, beating me. Um, I'm. I'm not bragging. I'm tough to beat. I don't know. Yes. It just things happen for me. I don't know how it happens, but um, if I was only as successful in in everything else I do as I am in this league, stuff just <laughs> happens. Um, it's very weird. Um, yes. But uh, you know, I don't. I don't think I'm winning this year. So it's. I can just tell. So, um, but, uh, you know, I hope, uh, I hope your imaginary baseball team, um, does well this year and, you know, you deserve, you deserve a chance. You deserve another playoff chance. I mean, we only have, you know, half, half the teams in the league don't make the playoffs in our world. So I think, you know, it's what four or six, you know, out of, out of 14. So, and then there's going to be some expansion teams next year to beat up on hopefully. So, you know, everybody is geeked about this. Everybody I talk to about this is like, can't wait for there to be an expansion draft so we can have our own little, like, you know, what players are we going to lose to the the Marlins and the Rockies or the (laughs) take this guy. Hey, Lewis Brinson, you want to come back? (laughs) Yeah. You know, and, None of those, you know, in the expansion, I actually think I, we actually think we might have a fight over who, who wants to give up their current team and do the expansion team and build a team from scratch from yeah. cast offs from the other team. I actually think it'd be a really neat challenge. If I didn't I'm have Otani, I would team. agree to that. 110%. <laughs> yeah. So you'd have to give up Otani. But that's not happening. No, I understand. So please hold on to him. So, you know, I don't care how much it'll cost me forever and ever. So, all right, man. I, uh, I really appreciate all your time. Um, you know, this probably probably could have thrown another, uh, gone on for another hour or whatever, but uh, you know, it's, it's you know, I mean, since I'm not editing these things very much, so, but I really appreciate your time and um, you know, best of luck to the Cubs um, and the blues and everybody else. Um, <laughs> Best I'll, I'll warn you, years. whenever I go to Chicago to visit my friend Drew, who's the owner of the Chicago Agrarians, um, I haven't gotten to do that, obviously, in a while. But uh, we always go to Wrigley Field, and we try to make it for a Reds-Cubs game. And the last couple times, the Reds have won those games, which is very odd because they generally don't. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I'll think well, about sure you. I'm sure everyone there treated you nicely. And if, you know, the Reds win, it's, it's not really a big deal nowadays. You know, it's just like, all right. Yeah. Well, I was know. out in the bleachers getting sunburned and like 
Nick Senzel was like actually playing well instead of getting hurt all the time. And we won like 10 to three. And I was like, I was kind of embarrassed afterwards. There's all these Cub fans around me. I'm wearing my Reds hat. And I'm like, I'm like, oh man, we kicked your ass. <laughs> Sorry about that. You know, well, if they're real Cubs fans, they didn't care too much. No, I know. Um, but uh, I also, um, I once rode a bus to go from Cincinnati to Chicago back in 2003. And the Reds were crappy that year. It was the end of the season and they, they, helped keep the Cubs out of the playoffs. Uh-huh. I think it was 2003 went up to see one of those games too. And okay. that one I felt bad about. Cause you know, like that was why you couldn't have nice. Or it, it, I, don't, I don't think they were out of the playoffs because of it, but it, it messed with them. I mean, cause I think that was the same year as the Bartman thing. Yeah, that was, yeah. And then they didn't make it. So the- I don't know if I'm going to make it. I don't, I don't know if I'm going to make it to any Cubs games this year or not, but uh, we'll see. I mean, I'm definitely yeah. taking my son to Cincinnati for some Reds games, but you know, I don't know. I've been there as well. I saw, this is my only, the only time I've ever been in uh, Great American Ballpark. I saw Reggie Abercrombie. Do you remember him? He was an outfielder for the Marlins years Uh, ago. Tool shed, yeah. He hit the furthest ball ever hit in Great American Ballpark at that point. And this was during prime Adam Dunn eras. I can't remember how I mean, Dunn hit one literally into the Ohio River. It was about 500 feet. It was hit to just left of center field. And I mean, wow, it was unlike anything I'd ever seen at the time. But before that game, I, we, we were there super early and I got a ball and went down and uh, I have it somewhere around here, uh, signed by Miguel Cabrera, uh, the pitcher, Scott Olson, I don't remember. And there was someone else there. I, I think that sounds right. Olson. Marlon. Yeah. And then there was another one. Were you rooting for the Marlins at this time? No, we were. I was just like a baseball. I was just there as a fan, like whatever. Oh, okay. I was. I was with my buddy on like. And it was Marlins break. and Reds. Okay, all right. Yeah, and, and right. we met all. I can't remember the third guy, but he was someone who had turned up pretty decent. Yeah, it was like one of the craziest games. I'll never forget it for sure. It was okay. I'm gonna go look up Reggie Abercrombie uh, long home run. I've no, tried to look this up before, and I've never found the video. I've tried. Okay. Yeah, it's know. like. This, this was also like 2005. Okay. Yeah. Um, seems- like in my YouTube history, I wish you could see my screen right now. Reggie Abercrombie home run first in Cincinnati. And it's like, <laughs> I've tried this. I've had this conversation before. Oh no. Yeah. Here it is. All right. Send me a link. <laughs> we'll send it to you. <laughs> All right. I don't know if this was, I thought it was a night game, but whatever. This is All right. Fun. All right, man. <laughs> it's time. I'll uh, I'll I'll talk to you soon. Hey, we're gonna do a we're gonna do a, a virtual happy hour for the All Star Game. That's the plan. So Sounds we'll see how many great. people we can get. So Sounds Crash great. Crash is super amped about this. So <laughs> uh, and it's we've got to at least try. So yeah, for sure. All right, man. All right. Have a good one. Appreciate it. Enjoyed right. it. Have a good one. See ya.